falou. Let's see. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Hello, Babs. How are we doing? Good. Oh, I think you're on mute there, Barbara. What? You're on mute. I can't hear you if you're talking. I hear you, Barbara. I'm on mute. I can hear you, Barbara. No, she's not on mute. Yeah, I can hear Barbara fine. Uh oh. Sean's lost his hearing. There we go. There we go. That was me. Got I came in and out with my uh, my other earpieces were connected to it at the time. I've got two of these things. I run out of battery. So much I talk on the stupid phone all day long. <laughs> uh. All right. Hey, it's Don Luke. How are you? Doing well, Sean. How are you this evening? Yeah. Ducky. All right. Hey, Barbara. No. Too bad. And I heard, oh, there she is. Hey, Linda. I'm here. So earlier today, I sent an email with a, um, a copy of the deed for 57 Shaw Drive. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's probably in your inbox. So. Yeah, I saw that. Restriction. Okay. It is it's called conservation restriction area. It's um it's hang on, somebody's coming in though. <laughs> it's a it's a remote meeting. It's it's purely remote, yes. Okay. All right, I'll let them know. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Uh oh. What was that? Someone thought that was in person. Somebody thought we had an in person meeting. So. Uh, 
we got about another minute or so. Let people come in. Who do we have? We have a lot of panelists. I see Jen. Hello, Jen. How are you? Great. How are you? Doing well, thanks. Yeah, those folks, if they were panelists, if you could change your name to the actual name, it would certainly help on our end. If you could take a quick second to do that. We can identify you. I guess our question is, how do you edit that to your name? Well, that's way about my pay grade. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay. I think you can. I think you can just you write. Know, if you write, we're, click we're, on the. We're all set. I think we found it. Yeah, oh. if you have those little dots. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, we got a quorum here. I know uh, Tom was coming, so. Um, and Jenny is not coming this evening. She's letting me know. Oh, there's Tom coming in right now. All right, Linda, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, commission members, here we go. We got, we got a doozy tonight. We'll try to be uh, quick and uh, to the point. Uh, seeing that we've got a quorum at 631, I'd like to begin a conservation commission meeting for Wednesday, October 18th, 2023. Uh, notices and agendas are to be posted at least 48 hours in advance of all meetings, excluding Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays. One may watch or may, may participate remotely with a meeting link that can be found in the following link. Pursuant to Chapter 2 of the Act of 2023, this meeting will be conducted by remote means in accordance with applicable law. This meeting may be recorded, which will be made available to the public on WACAN as soon after the meeting that is practical. Uh, did take note that Linda Hansen is dying in from the town uh, building there. Luke Legere, Jen Perlman, Barbara Howell, Tom Davidson, and myself, Sean Fair, are all dying, dialing in remotely. With that said, let's start the public hearings. Uh, we're on 1A. Uh, we don't have a DEP number there, Linda. Is that right? Uh, we checked today. Maybe, Fred, did anything come? I, I didn't see anything today um, on the DEP portal. So. Okay. Yeah, it, uh, uh, they're waiting for the, uh, for the check to clear. They've had it for two weeks, but <laughs> they haven't uh, cashed it yet. Okay. Uh, so this is 27 Algonquin Path, no DEP number. It's an abbreviated notice of resource area delineation filed pursuant to Wetlands, Wetlands and Water Resource Protection Bylaw and the Wetlands Protection Act submitted by Patricia Martson for the uh, confirmation of a resource area delineation at 27 Algonquin Path at Wayland, Massachusetts. The site is shown in Assessor's Map 43C, Lot 014, and is located within the 100-foot buffer zone of a bordering vegetative wetland and also the 200-foot riverfront area. Linda. Uh, Fred King is, uh, I think, is representing the client here or the applicant. If you wanted to just present the project to the commission, okay. It's a uh, this is a uh, an NRAD for the uh, at basically an updated air NRAD for the uh, for the site. Um, if I could share my screen, I guess this um, this uh, is roughly three point nine eight acres of land um, off of Algonquin Path. And, and garden path. The, um, uh, this was before the commission back in 2005 for the, uh, for the redevelopment of the, of the existing house. Uh, basically the old house was taken down and the new house was, uh, was put in under that, under a fil filing back then. Uh, but of course it's 18 years old and we've been hired by the applicants to do an evaluation of the site to see you know, with the with the current re regulations and all all that, what uh, what you can do with the property uh, or if anything. So um, so this is a, an updated uh, ANRAD to uh, to re uh, renew the uh, the wetlands delineations on the site as part of our, of our evaluation. So let me just. Uh, Can just interrupt, Monica? Could you check check your text message, please? Yeah, I don't have my phone with me. Uh, let me grab it. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> okay. Right. Can I'm sorry. Can everybody see this? Uh, nope, not not sharing. Yeah, I don't think. Okay. No, nothing's happening. All right, hold on just a second. Okay. So can everybody see that? Nope. Oh boy. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Okay. This is the um the parcel. I'm I'm using the old wetlands delineation um uh, uh site plan that just for um uh, for orientation purposes and to see where this was back in two thousand five. So we have the um the three point Nine eight acres of land here. There's the current house. This is Dudley Brook at the eastern side of the property, north is to the left. Um, this is the outlet stream for Dudley Pond. Uh, Dudley Pond is located to the south uh, across the uh, the aqueduct from here. And this is uh, the filing that was made. Uh, this was the existing conditions plan at that time. So uh, what you have, but what this shows nicely is the uh, the eastern property line is the center line of Dudley Brook. It flows from right to left, uh, and then this at that at that time they uh, they had the riverfront. This is a perennial stream, or a presumed <laughs> perennial stream, and I have no information that says it's not a perennial stream. So we're presuming that it still is. Uh, Especially this year, it's uh, it's been flowing every day. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, the um, they showed the riverfront line as the the basically the main bank of the brook, and uh, then the and then this here is the uh, is the BVW line. So, uh, and then of course the buffer zones and so forth that are related to that. So let me just uh, get out of this one. Taking a second or a lower, okay. Okay. Can everybody see this now? Yep. Okay. So this is the, the current wetland delineation. What we found, and this, by the way, is the, the new house that was was built in there. We, we did a, a new topo of this as part of our evaluation of the, of the property. But what you can see is the, the bank coming along like this, similar to what, what was shown on the old plan. But this year we did the, I did the delineation back in, uh, at the end of April, at April 25th. And at that time, um, it's very clear that this area right here, uh, there is several breaks in the channel in, in the main bank of, of Dudley Brook. And the water actually, it's uh, during the mean annual high water. And at the time of my delineation, the uh, basic, it was my judgment that the uh, elevation of mean annual high water was about six, the, the actual water level at that time was about six inches lower. But what happens is there's breaks in the in the bank and the water flows not only in the mainstream, but it also flows out and goes through the wetlands and then rejoins the mainstream down here. 
and if there's like three breaks in the in the bank all flowing into the wetlands and then following a channel and down into the uh, back into the ch main channel so it's that uh, forms like a little oxbow along the banks there but but essentially the the mean annual my mean annual high water is is quite a bit more upland of that and what we should have here so based on this and the bvw uh, along here is is in this area and I have two transects and my report, I don't know if any of you have read my report, but I did two transects to help out with the delineation line. And it's a very easy line to do uh, as well as the, um, as the, the mean annual high water was very easy to do because we were, it was practically at mean annual high water. So I was able to see exactly where the water had been this spring. And I was able to go around that for the uh, for the mean annual high water, and also uh, the wetland delineation. Uh, you've got a fairly steep hillside coming down to the wetland, and so the the uh, the edge of the BVW is about you know very very close to the bottom of the slope, uh, probably another foot or so in elevation going up the hill. So very very simple line to to uh, to delineate that and I'll show you a all right so this this is a little uh, some slides of the uh, can everybody see this pretty yep okay uh, so here's uh, Dudley Dudley Brook heading, uh, looking north uh, downstream. And you can see this was, like I say, it was on April 25th, and it was pretty close to mean annual high water. Uh, I got some that show a little better, better than that. Okay. You can see the, see the bank undercut here, and then it goes, goes down under here. So we're about, it's about six inches lower. And this is this is looking upstream, uh, which would be looking south uh, on from that same location. So pretty easy to determine. Um, this is the main channel way out here, but what happens is this is one of the breaks in the in the uh, in the main bank, and the water comes in and flows right through the wetland and on out. And this is one of my mean annual high water. Uh, flags, which was just uphill, that there was a rise in, in grade right here. Um, and so it's just outside. Uh, this is still within the wetland, but it's, uh, but the, the, I was able to follow the, the stream channel all the way down through. So it moves, here's, not, here's the main break in the, in the bank. There's, there's Dudley Brook going by out here, flows in through here, and then that it follow, you can just follow the trail all the way down, or the, the, the brook flow all the way down, and then rejoin, this is the end of it, and it rejoins the main channel. So um, my call was a lot higher up than the previous call on that. Um, I just happened to have the advantage of doing it on under real uh, mean annual high water conditions. So. Um, it was easy to see this. I, I think if you did it at another time of year, if it was a drier year, this wetland area gets so thick, you would never even notice that that was out there. So, uh, and it's, and today it's even still uh, quite wet like this because of all the rain we've had. Um, this is, it, you can see that these are some of the wetland flags. Coming around, you can see that the, basically this is the wet area. There's a little grade drop off right here, and uh, then that's one of my uh, the yep, pink flag is a mean annual high water. So it's out out in the edge of the wetlands and in, inside it. And this just for your information, this is uh, one of my transects. Uh, this is on in on the wetland side of the of the. Uh, <clears throat> the wetland line, and you can see the standing water about six inches below the surface. 
Uh, you can see the gray, that's the, the gray material that came out from the bottom and then a very black uh, topsoil in there. So that, that this is the wetland plot. And this is just up uphill from it. And you can see how nice and bright that subsoil is. I'm down 14, 15 inches, no, no water in this hole. Uh, so because it's it's all sandy soils down here, you usually get a, a, a nice clean wetland line. Uh, along it, very usually easy to do. Uh, this is where that transect was. The, uh, you see one of the plots right right here. And the other one down there, and there's the wetland flag, right where the where the, the slope drops off. You can see the skunk cabbages and so forth down here. And there's another blue flag right there. It's a tough to see, but it goes around, and this is looking south. And that's just what the upland looks like. Up the, the wetlands are down down here to the right, and the slope coming up. This is where the um, Hiawatha Path is up on the top of this rise, but uh, very dense wooded up upland sto uh, overstory. Uh, a lot of you know oak, uh, red oak, and white pine is the basic, uh, and some some uh, uh, beeches thrown in there too. So that's pretty much it. Um, And uh, I guess you're, you're not going to be able to close the hearing tonight. <laughs> and I don't no. know if anybody's had a chance to look at it. Do you, do you like to schedule a, a site walk or something? Or? Yes, I would if you have time next week. Um, this <clears throat> we can we can trade schedules at some point. Sure. Yep. Uh, I checked the flags uh, last week, and they're still all up. Okay. So uh, it's ready to ready to be looked at. So can you stop sharing the screen? Uh, sure. Just... You know, is there anything else in on this one? I know we have to continue. No, I was just curious how, how the how different the mean annual high water was from <clears throat> the previous from the previous delineation. And that was when was that? That I have 2009, I guess. Um, do you see much change in the in the elevation of mean annual high water? Uh, me? Um, yeah. No, it's it's probably always been that way. Okay. Um, it's just that if you didn't, uh, the vegetation in that wetland gets extremely, right now it's very thick. Um, so if if you weren't really looking for that, you would probably mistakenly put it along that, uh, along the bank, uh, the main bank of that stream and not see this So, But the, um, the evidence is there that it happens a lot. Uh, like I say, when I was doing it, it was probably six, inch lo six, six inches lower than what I would call the annual high water based on you know bank undercuts and, and that sort of thing. So yeah, it does definitely flow out into that wetlands uh, at probably every spring or most springs. Linda, anything else? No, I don't. It's you know, I, mean, I like to see the site. Um, I think some of the Dudley book is a little bit controlled as as an outlet structure from uh, Dudley Pond. So I, I don't know. How, I I'm not familiar at all with how they manage that that flow, but I'd be curious to see that at some point. So yeah, all it is is a culvert. <laughs> so, is that all it is? Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's just a big culvert. <laughs> I thought I thought they had a, a weir on it or something. Maybe not. There might be, but. Uh... Okay. Okay. No, we'll have so, to take a vote to, vote to continue this because we don't have a DEP file number. So. Yeah, and what, remind me, Linda, what's the next date of our next meeting? November eighth. November eighth. All right. So, looking for a motion then to continue this for November eighth, sometime after six thirty, please. So, so moved. Move. Second. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Tom, for the second. Quick roll call, please. Barbara Hall. Yes. Luke Legier. Yes. Jen Perlman. Yes. Tom Davidson? Yes. Sean, there's a yes. All right. Thanks, Fred. Okay, you're welcome. And Linda, I don't know if you make notes on any of this stuff, but I received an abutters notice for this for 27 Algonquin. 
I'm okay. on the other side of that stream. Yeah, um, no, I have. Yeah, I got all the I got all the um, better notices and the receipts. So, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Yeah, on to one B. This is Fifty Sherman Bridge Road DEP file number three two two dash one zero one nine. It's continued notice of intent filed pursuant to the Wetlands, Wetlands and Water Resource Protection Bylaw and the Wetlands Protection Act, submitted by Jennifer and Adam Greenstein for the demolition of an existing house and construction of a new house, driveway, and supporting utilities at 50 Sherman Bridge Road in Whalen, Mass. The property is shown on Assessor's Map 6, Lot 17, and is located within the 100-foot buffer zone of a bordering vegetative wetland in the 200-foot riverfront area. Linda. Um, Brian Nelson is here, I believe, to present the project to the commission. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, for the record, my name is Brian Nelson with Metro West Engineering. I'm here tonight with Jenny Greenstein, who's one of the owners. Um, and I'd like to, if I can share my screen, um, start with a um, couple plans. Uh, it says my screen share is loading, so when it says it's ready, I'll... There we go. Hopefully everybody can see that now. Yep, good to go. Um, so we're here for a, an NOI for um, 50 Sherman's Bridge Road. Uh, we're located on the southerly side of Sherman's Ridge, Sherman's Bridge Road, about a thousand or so feet west of the intersection of Sherman's Bridge and Alpine Roads. Um, it's a fairly large site. It's about 2.67 acres. Um, and just to orient everybody oh. to this plan, um, I'll zoom out a little bit. North is going straight up this page. Um, Sherman's Bridge Road is located up at the top right hand corner of the page where my cursor is um, basically running from northwest to southeast in this direction um, kind of a port shop or a hatchet shaped lot uh, relatively narrow frontage uh, we come back for about 200 feet or so and then the lot blossoms um, out in the back um, the existing house shown in brown is located about almost 400 or so feet off the sideline of sherman's bridge road uh, we also have an existing detached garage, um, pretty close to kind of that point of where the lot flares out in the back. Um, Sudbury River is um, basically right along the southerly boundary. Um, and again, or southwesterly boundary shown here, bank of the river, just a little bit. Um, bank of the river, the mean annual high water mark is shown in blue here. Um, and uh, one thing I will show some photos after I go through the, um, the presentation boards. The site has been um, recently cleaned of uh, some construction equipment and materials. Um, but, and this was done by the new owners. Uh, the site was, parts of it were used to store construction materials and um, equipment in previous years. Um, existing house, like I said, is shown um, kind of in the westerly side of the site. It's got a footprint of just under 1,200 square feet. Um, our detached garage, uh, which is located east of that, has a footprint of about 730 or so square feet. And we've got a gravel driveway that comes in off of Sherman's Bridge Road, um, comes in basically in a south southwesterly direction, flares out around the garage. So we'll turn around here, and then the garage terminates in front of the existing house. Um, there is a fairly substantial retaining wall um, that basically runs parallel with the uh, westerly, southwesterly edge of the driveway, and that's shown in this location here. Um, existing septic system is uh, about 50 feet or so south of the detached garage. It's shown in this location is where the soil absorption system is. Uh, we do have a uh, pretty moderate to, um, you know, some good topography across the site. We go from elevation 167 roughly at the northerly corner. And as we traverse in a southerly direction to the south, southerly lot corner, we drop about 50 feet in elevation. Um, there's a pretty steep hill out behind the house, which is primarily wooded. Um, and for resource areas, again, we've got the bank of the Sudbury River, obviously a perennial stream that's shown in blue on this plan. Uh, going out from that, basically we've got a bordering vegetated wetland, which is shown in red. Um, and that basically roughly parallels the river. Um, and just to give you um, the 30 foot no alteration zone, zone is also shown in red. And that's this line right here. Our 100 foot wetland buffer zone is um, this grape colored line. Um, 
basically again extending in a northeasterly direction. Uh, the 100 foot inner riparian zone is shown in blue and basically running in this direction here. And the 200 foot or the outer riparian zone um, located here, as you can see, a good chunk of this rear part of the property is located within the, um, the riverfront area. The existing house is located um, outside and as is the detached garage and the majority of the gravel driveway. Uh, we do have a little sliver of the existing driveway um, that is located within uh, the inner riparian zone. We have a lot of turf lawn uh, that is basically located um, as you head down the hill closer to the bank. So the inner riparian zone has, has a significant amount of lawn in it. Uh, just a few statistics. Um, there is a total of 55,620 square feet of riverfront area totally on the property. Majority of that, about 34,000, is located within the outer riparian zone, and about 21,600 square feet is located within the inner riparian zone. Um, I'm going to switch boards now, and this board is oriented the same way, again, with north going straight up the page, Sherman's Bridge Road at the top right-hand side of the screen. Um, what we're looking to do and um, is basically the focal point of this project is construction of a new house. Um, it's about 2,230 square feet. The existing house is located here. So we're overlapping that partly. New house will be um, basically extending a little bit further in a south southeasterly direction. Um, so we've got an increase of, of building footprint of about 1,000 square feet. Um, the house was was pretty carefully designed. It's basically it's it's a modest size house and a modest footprint. Um, there are basically um, two main living levels, and the garage is is basically at a level in the middle and of those two, the first and second floor. And what that allows us to do is basically kind of tuck this house into um, the hillside. So basically, keeping the same. Um, relationship of, of the the southwesterly face of the house um, towards the resource areas but again trying to uh, to really just kind of nestle it into the hillside because we, we do have some some contours going up um, from that level gravel area heading up the hill uh, what we've done is we've removed the gravel parking area uh, on the west side of the house and what we've done is we replaced that with a uh, garage will be uh, right up here, two-car garage, and then we'll have a relatively small parking area out front and a driveway that will lead up to it. So what we've done is we've removed the existing gravel here um, and, again, trying to pull everything as far away from the bank and the resource, the stream bank and in the inner riparian zone as we can with a parking area basically on the north-northeast side of the house. Uh, we do have a stormwater management system that will capture uh, runoff from the entire roof surface in this upper parking area. So it will provide treatment for um, the driveway surface through a catch basin that will be routed to a subsurface infiltration system located south of the, uh, the house. Um, with the stormwater management system in place, we'll be basically reducing runoff rates and volumes um, approximately 20% as you go from the two to 100 year storm. So there really is no runoff leaving the site for a smaller storm due to the sandy soil conditions. But as you go up to a larger storm event, um, we will see some significant reductions in, in rates and volumes leaving the property. Um, as I mentioned, the existing driveway um, south southwest of the house, that will be removed and that will be converted to lawn area. And what we're proposing is a restoration area. So to convert about 4,400 square feet of lawn that's in pretty close proximity to the wetlands and the um, bank. So it's really along the uh, southerly, well, southwesterly boundary. Um, proposing to let that restore naturally and to plant that with four trees and 30 shrubs. We'll plant two red maples, um, two swamp white oaks, uh, some dogwoods, viburnums, and um, so that's a restoration measure that we're offering um, it really in close proximity to the bank of the stream. Um, this project does classify as a redevelopment. We have a um, overall a site-wide uh, reduction 
in degraded area of about 410 square feet. Um, more importantly, I think um, what we've done is, is we've really taken as much impervious area out of the inner riparian zone as we can. Um, we're decreasing degraded area within the inner riparian zone by about 680 square feet. Um, so the um, wooded naturalized area will also increase by about 2,000 square feet. Um, and I, again, I just like to, before I, I show you some pictures kind of of the pre-existing condition, would just like to kind of demonstrate conformance with the redevelopment standards of um, the Rivers Protection Act. And the certainly the site work here offers an improvement over existing conditions. Um, we've got an existing condition for an existing house that's in rough shape um, and a, a pretty loosely packed gravel driveway that will be removed uh, to, the, to a great extent from the riverfront. Uh, we are providing stormwater management. Um, the work is provided is proposed as further from the bank as we're taking the gravel drive and we're moving that to the other side of the house. Um, we're reducing degraded area. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to um, just open up uh, one other thing. So if I can just screen share one other thing. Um, and then I would like to just turn it over to our applicant to um, to let her speak a little bit to um, just, you know, their, um, there we go. So I just want to show you a few pictures. Um, this is the area as you'd be coming into the site, you can see some piles of, uh, of stone. Um, this would be coming down the driveway. This would be teeing off to go down towards the bank. This would be running towards the existing house. There were some storage trailers um, and some other uh, piles you can see over here. Um, we've got some vehicles, some tires, some construction equipment. Uh, this is up near the detached garage. This is down by the main house. Again, we've got uh, trailers, we've got vehicles, we've got some tools and some other things in close proximity to the house. Um, this is the end of the gravel driveway. And this is the retaining wall, uh, kind of looking at from the gravel driveway down a flight of stairs. You can see the river in the background, and we've got some construction materials on either side, um, some piles of, of construction materials, again, a little bit closer to the river, and some more. This is the retaining wall. The house is up back here. So again, we've got uh, construction materials uh, in fairly close proximity to the river. Um, a lot of those have been removed. And um, with that, I, I'd like um, Jenny to speak a little bit, just to kind of introduce herself and um, to add anything that, that I may have missed, and then we'd be happy to answer any questions. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Jenny Greenstein. Um, we, uh, you know, we are happy to be here and thankful for your input. Um, you know, I think we were attracted to this lot uh, because of its proximity to the river and uh, the surrounding um, conservation areas and, um, you know, just want to be good stewards of the land. And it's really our vision to kind of live in conjunction with nature. We've got two young kids. We want to introduce to the different, uh, flora and fauna of the area. Um, and so we're hoping to, um, to do it by the book. Thank you. Uh, Linda, how'd you start? Um, Oh, where's my? Oh, we, we talked about whether or not you needed a CBA review for this. Did you did you double check on that, Brian? I did. I talked to the new building inspector again, and he had um, basically indicated that uh, you know, we talked about the the nonconformity of the existing garage, and he was okay with it. Um, said that he's the one who'd be reviewing the permits, so. Um, so he had no issues with it. Uh, second time we had, we discussed it as well. All right. So remind me again, how many trees were you planning on taking down in the riparian zone? Uh, in the riparian zone, I believe, and let me check, but I believe it's just two. Um, there are some more that are becoming down, actually. Let me just take a look and see. I know there's eight total. Um, but I believe there's just two or three of them that are actually within the um, outer repairing zone. I mean, the entire repairing zone, I mean. 
Yeah, well, there are no trees to be removed in the inner 100. So oh, okay. there are just um, a couple trees up behind the existing loca house, location of the existing house or the proposed house. Um, but I believe most of those are actually um, outside the riverfront. No, Barbara, you have a question? Oh, sorry, it doesn't sorry. look like it. They're actually all in except for two, maybe three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I think I count thirteen. Yeah, some of them are snags. Um, so oh, some of them are very okay. dead. Oh, okay. All right. So, are you keeping the container and the sheds? Uh, the container is, I believe, is gone, um, and the sheds, oh. uh, I believe, the owners would like to keep for now. Um, Okay, you have the container on your on your proposed plan. That's what I was asking. Yeah, the container is gone now. And again, we had drawn the plans, um, both existing condition survey and proposed plans um, prior to the site being cleaned up. Okay. And so are the sheds included in your impervious calculations? Yes, they are. Okay. And, you know, I... I think I have something different than you do because under your proposed, it it says gravel drive to to removing that, but are, then are you keeping the the retaining wall and the stairs then? Yes, yeah. There's a pretty uh, abrupt grade change uh, okay. for the retaining wall, so we felt it would be best to minimize disturbance and leave that in. Okay, and so all that is added up in the impervious, the retaining walls, the stairs, the sheds, all that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Barbara, you have a question? Yes. They said that they were going to alter 3,993 square feet in the inner riparian and 4,146 square feet in the outer. This is over 8,000 foot alteration and the wetland protection act is very clear it says within the 200 foot of the riverfront the issuing authority that's the commission may may alter may allow the alteration of up to 5000 square feet or 10% of the riverfront um so uh, this you're way over well what we're doing is um well, there's we temporary can't... disturbance that will happen with construction activities and removal of um of the gravel drive uh construction of the new house the the permanent numbers are indicated on our site plan in the tables um, so we do wind up with a, a net reduction in degraded area um, and a net reduction in lawn area within the 100 foot riverfront. So um, we but do feel like we're, we're making things better with a, a reduction in degraded and an increase in, in naturalized area. What did you say, Barbara? It, there's still over 5,000 alteration. So is, is it 5,000 new alteration or if it's yeah, total, if are, total, there's a temporary alteration, um, you know, again, just due to construction activities and for the, the conversion of gravel drive to lawn, uh, some of the, the wooded area up top will be create converted from a natural condition to um, a degraded condition. When you, when you boil that all down, um, there's, a reduction of about 410 square feet of degraded area, a reduction of about 1,550 square feet of lawn area, and a creation of just under 2,000 square feet of wooded or naturalized area. So maybe maybe we have to walk through table one in your project narrative because that you know I, I'm I'm trying to add up and I get if you're if you're taking the table five I should say. The, the total land use when the, uh, um, within the in the riverfront area, you have proposed impervious area of 4972. 
And I'm assuming that includes existing or is that, or am I adding those two together, the existing and the proposed? Well, there's basically, there's a delta between the two. So the existing condition is 2626. Um, the proposed is 4972. So there's an increase of 2346. Okay. So, but uh, the total to is the still 49. Column, and you're, the total you're is still 4972. Yeah, but you're reducing gravel in the next column by 2756. You're going from 4360 down to 1604. Um, you know, so we broke out the gravel drive versus the the paved driveway that will be created um, and the building surface, um, but they're all degraded area according to the act. So you know you're you're gaining 2350 of impervious, but you're also giving back 2800 square feet roughly of gravel. So there's a a net decrease there of just about 410 square feet. Barbara, you, you that make sense? Did that answer your question? Uh, I'll leave that to Linda. <laughs> she is... Yeah, I, I guess I'm just a little confused with it. So if I add up existing impervious and gravel, I get 69.86, right, total. Mm -hmm. And when if you add up proposed, you're saying it's it's 65.76. That's correct, yeah. I'm so just we're trying reducing to it by with you right now, yeah. This, 390 square feet is the difference from um, existing to proposed as far as, as uh, alteration in the riverfront. Mm -hmm. And again, the, the, the redevelopment is, is that, that driveway, so the gravel area is being replaced with a driveway that's located further away from the bank, certainly consistent with 1058.5. Um, and the fact that the entire roof surface of the house um, and the majority of the paved driveway will be um, captured and treated in a stormwater management system as well. Well, I mean, I think I think it's part of the mitigation. I think I'd like to see the shed outside of the hundred foot repairing zone, though. Um, usually, that's considered a no touch zone, and you already have stairs and retaining wall and everything else in the inner repair in. I, I think there's probably a better place for the shed um, than in the the inner repairing in air zone. We can certainly look at that. Um, I don't think that would be too much of an issue. Okay. It's a nice flat spot where it is. That's the thing. Um, and this site has kind of got those at a premium, but we could look at moving it maybe out of the riverfront. Mm -hmm. Or at least out of the inner, because uh, I think that, you know, that's that's that would be a plus. If you move it completely out of the repairing zone, I think that would be great. Um, well, I, I think we'd have to, to. I think we'd have to move it up near the garage. Um, oh, okay. Get into a flat area, because right now it's on a relatively flat area. Is that that area you know with the house and and the gravel drive is it's kind of terraced with the retaining wall and kind of with the house nestled into the hill so that sheds on a relatively flat area so we could probably uh -huh. take that and move it um over so it's just west of the uh, the existing garage okay so the other comment we saw with the previous um from the state i mean you're you're you don't have any comments from the state for some reason on your dep portal but if you i told you remember when we met to look at one weir meadow path and uh they were pretty um insistent that all the lawn had to be taken out of the inner repairing area also you know they they didn't want any alteration you could change it to a clover or something more natural you know um but they didn't they didn't want to they didn't want a manicured lawn in 100 foot in a repairing either so mm -hmm. um I think that that's something you need to consider. I know we're definitely committed to, you know, not doing anything in terms of like fertilizing and, and trying to, you know, create a mix down there that is, uh -huh. you know, uh, kind of self-fertilizing, low maintenance. Um, Again, we'd rather see like a wildflower mix, a clover lawn, something natural, and that's exactly what I mean. We we need to be consistent in our in our decisions, and that's that's exactly what they asked us to do, or the state asked us to do for another project up just up the river or down the river from you. So um, I think we should, I think the commission needs to be consistent with this one too, and and not have you know a, a, a 
sort of a an, an non native lawn in the hundred in your hundred feet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is clover considered native? I know it's... I think that's what they were doing. Isn't it? Remind me, guys. Is that, yeah, is that what they proposed clover. at, at uh, yeah. Weir Meadow Path? You're, yes. yes. It doesn't grow very high and it looks like a lawn, but. Well, right. I was reading that it might be considered invasive. That was my only concern with that. And the sheds will have to come out of there. Um, it, there was a concrete pad. I don't know what that was. Clover can be considered weedy by people, um, but it's not necessarily invasive. It just people call it a weed because it tends to grow really well, I guess, if that makes sense. And take over your lawn. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and then I guess there's a question about um, uh, looking at this, the stormwater management. Um, typically, when we have um, rebuilds, um, I, uh, sometimes the commission will call in a peer review for that, um, and I guess that's their decision. Um, yeah, that question, Linda, is that a statement? No, I mean, I you know, I, I haven't had a chance to really look at the stormwater. I, I just got back from vacation anyway, so I, I haven't had, and I don't, I don't. I guess I need I might need some more details on that anyway because I just see we have that in here. Well, we did submit a um, hydrology report which Dr. Yeah. is in proposed. So the the hydrology report's pretty thorough. Okay. Um, to me, it's a relatively straightforward system. Uh, it, it's really roof gutters, downspouts, um, which connect through a manhole. Uh, we've got a catch basin with a deep sump at the far end of the. Um, the little parking court uh, for treatment and capture a runoff. And then that basically just flows downhill into the infiltration system. Um, you know, worked in this, in this part of Wayland, Lincoln, Sudbury surrounding area for years. Uh, we've got pretty good outwash gravel here. Um, so this system, you know, with an infiltration rate kind of stormwater management policy was going to guide us to 8.27 inches per hour, I mean, this is less than two minutes per, per inch per grade soil. So um, the system is very conservatively designed. So you're using the sand infiltration rate of 8.27? Yes. Yeah. So is, the, is the, the driveway up to the parking court, is that paved or is that gravel? It's paved, um, basically. And I can share my screen again and I can show yeah, you. Because I'm, I'm looking at the, the proposed site plan and I don't, I don't see any details on that. Um, yeah, it's basically the, the new driveway. This is the, the parking court. We've got the catch basin here. It's paved down to here. So we're capturing runoff from, from here. So there will be a little bit that runs unchecked, but we still have um, a, a pretty significant uh, reduction in rates and volumes. Again, with smaller storms, this site really doesn't generate much runoff, almost none in terms of rates and volumes. Um, as you get up to larger storms, you start to, to generate some some volume, but we're reducing that by about 20% in the post-development condition. Okay. I'm just concerned about the mount coming off the driveway because that looks pretty steep and it looks like it's just going to run right into the gravel of the driveway, right? But I guess it's all it is, on. but really the grade is no different than what's existing. Oh, up there, yeah. Um, okay. And then we've also, like I said, you know, the amount of, right now there's no stormwater management in place. So you've got the runoff coming off the house um, and all the driveway surfaces running unchecked with the new construction, you know, this whole gravel area goes away, the roof surface in this upper. So you're probably taking 75% of your impervious surfaces and, and directing them to the system. So there is a, a pretty significant reduction. Um, okay. Well, let me have a chance to look at that in more detail. Um, and maybe we can, uh, and did you, did you, oh, yeah, am I confused? I thought you had, didn't you have a list of replacement plantings? Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, for the restoration area, yeah, yeah, we've got uh, four trees and I believe 30 shrubs. We've got some swamp white oak and some maples. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. And two different type of viburnum and um, I forget what the other one was. Hold on. Uh, silky dogwood. So trying yeah. to get some transitional plants so that would be happy on that slope. Okay. Okay.
I guess I guess I just I know I guess I'd just like to get some more again you know um get some more clarification on on how much of this is because in in your notice of intent doesn't necessarily match up with your tables so you're doing some temporary um disturbance but then you're um but the permanent stuff you say is only 6576 yet it says 8000 something or the 8100 in the, in the NOI so um I don't know. Do we need that? Do we need that called out better? Well, what I can do is there's two different things I can do is is the the temporary disturbance. Really, I just tried to draw a polyline around the area of construction activities just to say that, uh -huh. you know, this this area will be temporarily altered during the construction process. But when you get to the end of the line and construction's completed, you will wind up with a reduction in regraded in degraded area. Yeah. Uh, wind up with an increase in naturalized area. Um, I think most importantly, that inner 100 feet really benefits because we're we're reducing impervious area, um, or you know degraded area, and we're also um, we are increasing naturalized area pretty substantially. Um, you know, so there's about a 4,000 square foot increase in wooded or naturalized area within that inner riparian zone, decreasing lawn by amount the same, and, and then about a 630 square feet decrease in impervious area or gravel area. So um, the inner 100 really benefits. Um, we've got a, an increase in the outer, um, you know, we've got an increase in impervious, we've got a decrease in in gravel. So we've got a slight increase of a couple hundred square feet of degraded area in the outer riparian zone, which again would be fine well under that, that uh, 5,000 square foot or 10% threshold. Well, is it worth making that change on the NOI in page three, where you put, you know, the total square footage and in parentheses say how much of that is temporary? I can um, certainly do cause... that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, like I said, whatever, uh, you know, whatever helps you guys feel comfortable with it. Because um, that, that immediately just throws up a red flag for me. If you're, if you're um, proposing 81, 39 square feet of total alteration and really you're, you know, 10% is 55, 62. And then, you know, I mean, it's just it's just badly designed this NOI because it doesn't tell you what is degraded either. You know, so and then I'd like to see if you could you could maybe take the shed out of the inner riparian and then and um, indicate where you're going to be putting in sort of a, a clover or a, a naturalized mm -hmm. you know um, lawn area, not a you know not a um, Kentucky bluegrass stuff. Yeah, we can do that. That's So Linda, I just want to make sure I understand what you're asking. One is to kind of redo the NLI, put, put the correct numbers or make it a little more uh, understandable there. Two, putting clover or some type of uh, native grass instead of lawn. And then three, moving a shed out of the inner riparian. Um, yes. Anything else? Was that it? From your end? Yeah, so I'm asking is anything else from your end that you, could, that you see? I don't think I mentioned anything else today. Barbara, are you, are you checking no. me? And then, and then they're not going to be mowing it. It's the there's going to be a right by the riverfront. It's going to be left natural. Okay. Maybe that's my commission. No, I just I just need a little. I need a I need a little extra time to review the um, stormwater report too. Yeah, maybe what I can do is um, if you've got time, sometime uh, later this week or next week, I can stop by. Um, we can go over the stormwater report and okay. just kind of run through some of the numbers just so I can um, either put a memo together that that kind of addresses um, and it offers some more clarity or or if I need to. Um, in the past, I've put together a type of plan which does a more detailed breakdown of the different land uses and existing and proposed conditions. And it kind of offers like a bookkeeping analysis of how you go from existing to proposed. Okay. Commission, anything else? Hopefully we can get the thing wrapped up next time. We have a look. Yeah, just a couple of quick ones, Ron. I think Linda hit on the, the biggies um, that I had. There was a concrete pad I, I noticed shot right down by the river there. That's existing, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct, yeah. Was any thought given to removing that? So we talked about that. Um, the, the owners um, would like to enjoy the Sudbury River, and so it would be a nice place to store canoe or kayak or kayaks. So 
our, our preference would be to leave it. Um, if it needs to be removed, we can take it out. Um, but, it, you know, I think the owners, again, we discussed that pretty early on in the process. Okay. Um, and then... No, I don't think that was ever permitted. So I don't know. I don't know how that got there, but that was never permitted. And we would have never, and we would have never permitted it anyway. It shouldn't be there. Well, so so maybe some maybe worth thinking about removing that and just replacing it with a, some sort of other kayak rack or something like that um, that that would be a little more friendly to to the river. Um, the only other question I had was um, if I again sort of got this right, the what, there's what I'm going to call a spur that I think is kind of a, a vestige of the existing drive. Um, so without the planet, it's maybe a little hard to describe, but as you're coming down the screen drive, again, so hopefully, uh, that, yeah, that might help. Hopefully it loads in one second. Okay. Yeah. So as you come, uh, as you're coming onto the property from Sherman Bridge Road past the, the existing garage there, um, before you turn right up mm -hmm. towards the house, so there's that little kind of, I'm calling it a spur. Yes. Where your cursor is yep. right now. Um, and I'm just curious what the sort of purpose of that is and if that's something that uh, you might be able to part part with and just have the driveway continue up to the house and have, let that return to something natural yeah i was actually thinking about that i think the the architect's intention with that was like a place to turn around or mm -hmm. you know park if you need to unload things towards the back of the house but i'm totally open to you know making that lawn and and just making the driveway go up and and not continue forward that would make sense to me if it's something you're comfortable with, because I, the, it seems like the design of of the drive up, what else I'd call behind the house, you know, should allow for drop offs and turnarounds and that sort of thing. So, to me, that's just a logical spot where you might be able to, uh, you know, get rid of a little bit of, of impervious as well. Those like those are, yeah, I think that that's it for me, Sean. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Um, it's not like everybody kind of has their, their homework, and so hopefully we can get this kind of wrapped up next time. Um, so it looks like we're looking for continuance then uh, to the 8th, uh, sometime after 6.30, if that's amenable to everybody. Perfect. Can I get a motion, please? Yeah, I move that we continue the hearing under Chapter 194 in the Wetlands Protection Act to uh, November 8th, sometime after 6.30 p.m. Second. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, quick roll call, please. Barbara Howell? Yes. Luke Legier? Yes. Jen Perlman? Yes. Tom Davidson? Yes. And Sean Fersey, yes. All right, thanks, folks. Thank Here's you for your time. Have a good night. You too. All right, <clears throat> moving along. Uh, so those were those were yeah, one, two, three C. Okay, well, time check. We're on C, and we're on track to be done by one thirty in the morning. So let's see if we can't uh, speed up things a little bit here. Uh, we're on ninety two Lincoln Road, DEP file number three two two dash one zero one five. It's a continued notice of intent filed pursuant to Wayland's Wetlands and the Water Resource Protection Bylaw and the Wetlands Protection Act submitted by James Edmond for replacing the failed septic system at 92 Lincoln Road in Wayland, Mass. The project is shown on the Setzer's Map 8, uh, Lot 008, and is located within the 100-foot buffer zone of a bordering vegetated wetland. Linda. I took a site visit. They just they just submitted a, um, a revised plan to the Board of Health. I don't know if I even have that. Um, I, didn't, I did not get a hard copy of that. Um, but I did take a site visit afterwards. Um, yeah, I, I you know I, I emailed Karen. Is she on? I am. Here I am. Oh, yeah. there you are. Okay. Um, and you know, I, it 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 really does appear to me that the the lawn has been the wetlands was converted to lawn at some point in the in the past. Um, it's really really mushy down there, and um, I was hoping for a, a larger restoration area. The um, the plan says something required plantings within the 25 foot buffer C table above, but that's not how it's shown in the plan. So I just wanted to get some um, clarification on that. So they, they propo we're proposing 48 um, shrubs and but, we're just gonna plant them in that strip. 
And the 15 foot or the, the 25 15, foot? The 15 because foot. We, we're hoping a commission. So I did go out to the site tonight and I did see some soils, as you mentioned. Um, but the lawn and the commission, the, um, the lawn goes right down to the wetland, like to the wetland edge. That's Ben Lawn. The, the owner is actually here. If you want to let her in, um, Linda, I think she's a um, needs to be promoted. Okay. But she said she owned the house. This is the previous owner. She owned the house for 19 years, and she said they did not fill, they didn't, um, they didn't clear. Um, maybe a you know something here that was, or there that was um, was unhealthy, health, unhealthy. But they didn't expand the yard. I did go on I, to Mass Mapper back to. Um, 2019, which is as far as I could go on that. And it shows the wetland, it shows the um, trees, uh, the tree line in the same area it is now. Um, mm -hmm. So, the, so the, the, the applicant is putting in a fast system. They can't put the system in the front yard because the soils are inappropriate and there isn't enough room with the easements. Um, so that, that system in itself is extremely expensive. Um, the commission, the applicant doesn't want to do anything else, any other work. So they are hoping that the commission will, um, stay with the 15 foot buffer. Yeah. The, the, the area that you were talking to connect that would, that would, that would be a lot of their backyard. Oh, I realize that, but I mean, I look at the, yeah. I look at the, um, I look at the soil test. Yeah, everything above the waterline is fill. I mean, this whole area was filled at some point. There was never a, a, a Well and Protection Act um, permit for building this house in 1983. Oh, so we really yeah. don't have any ideas where the wetlands was. It's just curious because the two neighbors have wetlands much, much closer where W2 is and W10 is, FW10. And it just appears to me that there was a lot of fill brought in here. And then the, the, the wetlands was converted. So to that was more than 19 years ago, if it was done. I know, was, I know. Um, but I'm just yeah, saying yeah. that, you know, um, it's it's surprising that grass even grows there <laughs> how wet it is so i didn't i didn't find it that wet when i went out i didn't find it that wet up into the area that you were talking i actually i found it very dry i found it dry i found some some color in the soils but um i found the soils themselves dry we okay. need no disturbed area and that's so that's that 15 the that 15 foot would be the no disturb area So do you can you share could you share the plan please Linda for the um, commission? Oh yeah, I, you know I I don't think I called it up. Hang on, see if I can find it. Oh, where'd it go? So as I as I said before, the commission the applicant is going to great expense to put in this system, and um, kind of for financial reasons they'd like to. They're not going to go back any further than the proposed work, other than the plantings, but for financial reasons they'd like to. Um, keep that 15 foot if the commission um, would allow it. So who is who is the person who just sent me the the um, the septic plan? Where did that come from? It must have been Eric Dickers Dickinson. Okay. My didn't show any signature. Oh, by the way, this was approved yesterday after four yeah, no, months. I know that. I know the that. Board of Health, yeah. So it's yeah. been quite a while. This is the, um, if they don't get this approved tonight, they won't be able to put the system in um, due, to, due to the weather. So they can't put, for some reason, the system can't go in during the cold season. So they need to get this started. Um, they're they're pretty much in an emergency situation at this point. No, it's not. We're not gonna. We're not gonna not. Um, you know, oh, no, it's I a septic system. Everybody needs that. I just I just don't agree with your wetland line, and I don't agree with you know. I mean, I was hoping to get a little bit more restoration, but you know that's up to the commission. Um, right. If they're happy with the fifteen foot, I'd love to see some sort of physical barriers there too, so they don't. They don't, that it's not immediately converted back to lawn after the new owners move in. The and, new owners already moved in. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I, I don't know that. But, um, you know, a lot of times we do ask for some rocks, boulders, something like that to mark that That's 15 That's fine. Foot. We can add that. Okay. And I'll put that in the permit then. Okay. And, and As a condition, uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Commission, thoughts, comments, concerns? 
And, and the, the pump chamber is only 13.2 from the wetland. I, I don't think they have much choice, Barbara. That's the only place. And also, yeah, the condition, make sure you have no garbage disposal. Right. And mm -hmm. this, this was no signature of the registered sanitarian on my copy. Yeah, well, there's a brand new that was just submitted to Board of Health. What was that Monday? Did I get that? And so that's that's the most the most recent plan. Again, I'd like to have a hard copy of that at some point if I could. Certainly. Mm -hmm. They add on one page. They said it was built according to the um, Holliston uh, wetlands. Oh, I'll have the credit. <laughs> yeah, I saw that too. I saw that too. But because the soils are bad in the front or not great, and the in the in the back, the um, groundwater is thirty inches below in the test pit and thirty six in the other one. So there's a very high water gra groundwater in, table in this in the backyard. So that's why it's such an expansive system because they have to do it very shallow. Commission, anybody else? Are we okay with the uh, 15 foot with the Linda working with her to build a uh, barrier there? No disturbed barrier. Okay. I'm going to go with it if you guys are. All right. We're good. Barbara, when you're ready. So I move that we close the hearing under Chapter 194 and the Wetland Protection Act. Second. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Luke. Roll call, please. Barbara Howell? Yes. Luke Legier? Yes. Jen Perlman? Yes. Tom Davidson? Yes. Sean Ferris? Yes. Okay, Linda? Pardon me, uh, Barbara? I move that we issue order conditions under the Wetland Protection Act and a permit under Chapter 194 four with conditions as we discussed. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Roll call, please. Barbara Howell? Yes. Luke Legier? Yes. Jen Perlman? Yes. Tom Davidson? Yes. And Sean Perzi, yes. All set. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Okay. Uh, moving on to 1D, uh, 24 School Street, DEP file number 322-0965, continued notice of intent, file pursuant to the Wetlands Protection Act, submitted by Chris D'Antonio, Windsor Place LLC Construction, uh, seven new townhouses, driveways and parking areas, subsurface sewage disposal system, stormwater management system, uh, and supporting utilities at 24 School Street in Wayland, Mass. Property is shown on Assessor's Map 52, parcel 189, and is located with a 100 foot bordering vegetated wetland and land underwater. Linda. I'd like to invite um, Arthur Allen to present the peer review results. Okay, Doak. Thank you. Good evening. Arthur Allen from Ecotech Incorporated, peer review consultant for the commission. Um, I reviewed the project files, did desktop research, and visited the site on August 28th of this year. I subsequently provided a report with my findings dated uh, August 30th. Um, to summarize, uh, resource areas on the site, present on the site, bordering vegetative wetland, intermittent stream bank, and buffer zone. Um, in my opinion, there are no riverfront areas mapped bordering land subject to flooding, isolated land subject to flooding, isolated vegetated wetlands, map rare species habitat, or map certified or potential vernal pools present on this site. Um, the stream that's located just off site to the west was observed flowing during my site evaluation. Um, but rainfall conditions this summer have been significantly above normal, so that was not to be uh, unexpected. Uh, that said, the stream is mapped as intermittent on the most recent USGS map. Um, the USGS Stream Stats program provides 
a watershed area of 0 0.07 square miles. I also perform my own uh, independent watershed calculation and it returned the same result, 0 0.07, which is significantly below the 0.5 square mile threshold um, to even use the stream stats program to determine the, the flow duration. So, um, you know, again, it's, it, it's uh, you know, well within the parameters of, a, of an intermittent stream, and I would not consider that stream to be perennial. So there, therefore, no river front area associated with it. Um, in reviewing the wetland boundary, um, which had been you know reflagged based on the original approved delineation, um, I noted just uh, one uh, new flag that had been installed um, on the site, uh, a flag uh, between um wf1 and 2 and i noted uh hydric soils above um the flag w2 and i recommended connecting flag wf1 to wfa1 to wf3 and just eliminating wf2 um, in that one area where hydric soils were noted um, along the other flags i noted um, um, no well and indicators, including uh, hydric soils above the flags, um, generally at the toe of well-defined slopes for most of the line. Um, but again, um, soils and, and vegetation were considered. The only other um, water feature I noted on the site was a small um, fish pond labeled on the plans that um, I noted a, a plastic liner Again, it appears to be lined and the water's contained um, within a liner. The Wetlands Protection Act considers those type of water features to, um, to not be uh, wetland resource areas. Um, I don't believe there's anything to that effect in the bylaw, so I defer to the commission on the status of that lined uh, fish pond water feature, but it would clearly not be regulated under the Wetlands Protection Act. So that's the extent of my findings on the resource area reviews. Thank you. Thanks, Art. Sure. Linda, anything else? No, I don't. I don't have any. I don't have to add to that. So, uh, is anybody here else for this one? Yeah, we have uh, Mike Wiggins just raised his hand. Monica, are you on? Monica. Yeah, I got it. Yep. Michael Wiggins. Linda? Michael wasn't Mr. Horsley and raised their hands. All right, Mr. Wiggins, you want to go ahead? Thank you. Uh, wait a second. Can you hear me all right? Yes. I can, yep. Okay, sorry, I don't seem to be able to have video tonight. Yeah, um, we have substantial disagreement with the characterization of the stream as, as intermittent. Um, and I would point out, first of all, that just on a preliminary basis, it is a, it is a requirement, one mm -hmm. of the requirements of, of section 10.58, Ten point five eight. Uh, I'm trying to ten point five eight. Paragraph two, rent A one, E D through E. That an actual observation be made about stream flow. And of course, as Mr. Allen pointed out, I think in his comments that this was a wet summer. But that begs the question about whether or not uh, an observation should be made in a normal year. And there there is no evidence that's been presented in this case. We also would like to present evidence um, from Mr. Horsley about the history of this stream. There has been no, no evidence presented about the history of the stream, and we've developed quite a lot of evidence about the effect of, of man-made drawdown 
and other uh, effects in the immediate area on the, uh, the, the resource for this stream. So I'd like to have Mr. Horsley uh, present to you um, what he has found in looking at the history of the stream. Uh, so if uh, Scott, can you hear me all right? And can you I, go ahead? I can, I can hear you, uh, Michael. And with the chair's position, I'd like to share my screen. Sure. Yep. I'll try to ask you to keep it somewhat brief. I know we're running long tonight, so. I will try to do that. Uh, can you see this first introduction slide, Mr. Chair? I, yeah, I can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So yes, as uh, Attorney Wiggins uh, indicated, we've been uh, looking at this issue for frankly several years now. And uh, some of the commission members may remember we made presentations in the past. I know there are new members, so uh, I will uh, try to be uh, brief and to the point. But I also think given the amount of time that we spent on this, we should be afforded enough time to go through this and in a, in a uh, clear manner to make sure the commission has everything in front of them. So the question I'd like to address is the perennial versus uh, intermittent stream status tonight. And I'll start with uh, this slide, which is part of the wetland regulations, which in my own experience, I find doesn't get read often. There's a section in, uh, in uh, 10.58 subsection F that talks about perennial streams and I've highlighted, I think the most relevant section and that says, and I'll read it, rivers and streams that are perennial under natural conditions, but are significantly affected by drawdown from withdrawals of water supply wells, direct withdrawals, impoundments or, or other man-made, human, excuse me, human-made flow reductions shall, and as my all my lawyers that have taught me, the word shall is a really important one, different from May, uh, shall be considered perennial. Um, so first of all, uh, where does perennial flow come from in a stream? And the answer is groundwater discharge. Uh, so when groundwater levels change in an area, that can change the time period by which a stream flows and can change it from perennial to intermittent. Under natural conditions, a perennial stream flows year round due to groundwater discharge as is shown in this slide. And uh, this is a, I should mention that last slide I showed and this current slide are both from the United States Geological Survey, which, which I have always uh, have indicated is probably the best reference out there. So what this slide is showing uh, up under A, the top diagram, natural flow to the stream, perennial stream, and then a series of conditions under B, C, and D where water withdrawals are made in the watershed to the stream and essentially take water that would have gone to that stream and thereby reduce the amount of water in the stream and, and potentially change it from a perennial stream to an intermittent stream, which might only flow seasonally. Here's another picture of these conditions. Again, a perennial stream, the upper picture uh, is a gaining stream. It's receiving groundwater flowing into it as water levels decline due to anthropogenic uh, conditions, as we'll get to in a minute. Uh, as the water table decreases, that can that can reduce to a losing stream, or as in the picture down below, a uh, a stream where which is uh, recharging the groundwater and becomes an intermittent stream. Again, these slides are from the U.S. Geological Survey, specifically uh, winter, which is one of the more uh, probably the most recognized groundwater surface water uh, people in the industry, and. We will perhaps get into uh, tonight that there are references to U.S. Geological Survey topographic maps as a means of screening, and I would underline in bold the word screening, uh, whether or not a stream is perennial or not, um, as guidance given in the wetland regulations. This is a picture of the uh, USGS map uh, for the air subject area, and you see, and hopefully you can see my cursor here, uh, 24 School Street is located in this area here, actually right down at the bottom of the diagram. 
This is the stream under discussion and it is shown as a perennial stream. And the way I can explain that and confirm that is you'll notice the stream at this location is a solid blue line. Uh, whereas if we go upstream here to another location over here, we see a stream that's identified as an intermittent stream, which is a dashed and dotted broken line. That's the nomenclature that they used to differentiate between a perennial and an intermittent stream. So according to the U U.S. Geological Survey, um, this stream was identified as a naturally flowing perennial stream. Uh, there's also a study that has been completed in this area by, again, the U.S. Geological Survey that looked at, uh, frankly, the exact thing that the regulations talk about, and that is withdrawals in the area that might cause impacts on stream flow. And this is a study uh, of the Sudbury and Assabet River basins as a, a model. It was calibrated with actual flow data. And this is the study area of the watershed. Um, as I'll get to in a few minutes, our, our area is located up in this area of the model. In fact, here's a more detailed map where they broke out various sub watersheds. And this is the sub watershed right here. Uh, delineated as LCNA, where this project lies. And the um, and what this is showing, and you can read the subtitle here, figure 21, results of the model show that after looking at all of the water withdrawals from wells throughout this watershed, they found out that some of the sub-basins in the Sudbury River Basin were significantly affected by water withdrawals. In fact, um, I think if you read the numbers, uh, this is one of the top four uh, most impacted subwatersheds in the entire Sudbury Basin. And what this number is suggesting is that in this area, the stream flows, and we can refer to the uh, title here, are reduced uh, on order of 31% uh, based upon the water withdrawals in this area. Here's a close-up of it. Um, the 24 School Street, Street site is clearly located within this sub-watershed, which according to the U.S. Geological Survey um, is in uh, one of these most impacted basins. I think this directly meets the definition in the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act regulations that I referred to earlier. Uh, again, this is a a map of the site. And what we're looking at here is some of the development that has occurred within the subject area. And uh, the other component of this model that the U.S. Geological Survey identified is two things. One is the water withdrawals. And these dots represent the location of public supply water wells, which you can see uh, range from the northwestern part of the site to the western part to the southern part of the site all of which cumulatively cause, again, according to the USGS, these groundwater withdrawals that affect stream flow to the extent of 31% reduction. Uh, this slide also shows a network of roadways uh, which signify impervious surfaces, which also have a cumulative effect on the stream flow because what happens is the impervious surfaces preclude recharge to the groundwater, which which supports the base flow and instead um, uh, transfers that to surface runoff. So the, uh, the USGS model accumulates the effects of both the well withdrawal withdrawals uh, and, and the uh, impervious surfaces uh, that cause the net effect of the 31% reduction in stream flow in, this, uh, in the area of the subject property. Uh, here's a quick graph looking at the actual water withdrawal of the uh, wells, the, the Whalen well, uh, in this watershed. And uh, you can see that in the, the, the date of the map that I showed you before was, was 1970 in this area here. And it was actually based upon uh, aerial photography, which was done in a five-year period prior to that. Uh, you can see that uh, in addition to the water withdrawals, which are graphed here, which you can see steadily increase throughout that this time period, 
In addition to that, the Whalen Middle School was built uh, directly in the headwaters of this uh, stream. So there's two effects going on here. Again, there's the water withdrawals and there's also the impervious surfaces and they match quite well uh, with that date of that 1970 USGS map that I showed you, which again was compiled based upon data in the uh, mid to late 60s, whereby the stream was perennial. And then as a result of the water withdrawals and the uh, impervious surfaces, over time became intermittent as it's indicated up here. And again, I'll return to this uh, definition. Uh, this is not, these are not my words, this is the regulations. Rivers and streams that are perennial in natural condition, significantly affected by drawdown, withdrawals, or other human made flow reductions shall be considered perennial. Uh, we do have some photographs, uh, which we can, which I think we've already provided to the commission. I think that's, I think that's my last slide that I have here. Uh, I'm sorry, I have one more here, um, which gets into some of these uh, the eight interests and the setbacks. But I'm going to hold off on that for now, um, and I'm going to hold off with this one as well because these are relative to the septic system. Uh, the other thing I'll just put on the record here is that the project does propose a um, wastewater discharge, uh, which is uh, more than the thousand gallons per day, which is the cutoff in the uh, town of Wayland regulations, which would require uh, further analysis and require a minimum setback of 100 feet. And I don't believe the project complies with this standard uh, either. So I'm going to stop sharing there. Again, we do have other photographs, which we've uh, provided, which I think not only document the uh, U.S. Geological Survey and be interesting to see if anybody wants to take on that study, because I've used it in both federal and state court many times in the reference, uh, and they are uh, considered to be the definitive source of information. Um, and I think we'll rest our case on that for now. I suspect there are questions. I have a lot more to say, Mr. Chairman, but I'm going to, uh, based upon your direction, not to spend too much time, but we reserve the opportunity to submit a lot more information, which we have, uh, when we can do that. Thank you. I just, Thanks, just appreciate to, it. Mr. Chairman, just um, to add briefly, I think there are a couple of pictures we have, and I don't know if you want to look at those, but perhaps they could be called up. They just illustrate what the what the stream looked like uh, in 1969, and you know what ha what happened afterwards. And of course, there's the current USGS map cited that, that shows it as intermittent. But again, we would we would submit that that's a result of man-made drawdown. It's not a natural condition. We're not aware of any earthquakes or landslides that made the stream suddenly become from a, uh, a free-flowing natural stream to intermittent. Gotcha. Thanks, Michael. Uh, commission, thoughts, comments, and Linda, thoughts, comments, questions, concerns on any of that. Well, Sean, I, I would be interested to hear from our peer reviewer. Um, I think Mr. Allen gave us a really good summary earlier. I just would be curious to know if anything that Mr. Horsley just presented um, would influence Mr. Allen's opinion at all. I think I saw him on, still on here somewhere. Mr. Allen, if you're... Yep, here we go. Still there. Oh, Sorry. Thanks. I'd, I'd say, first of all, I, I mean, I don't even believe the historic USGS maps are relevant because the regulations refer just to the most recent USGS map and its identification of the, the stream status. I mean, clearly the most recent map identifies the stream as intermittent. Um, you know, I mean, again, it, it the watershed area is only 14% of the minimum required to even consider, you know, the other parameters, you know, base flow, um, you know, flow duration from stream stats. I mean, the stream has to be both, you know, either map perennial or have a, a, a half square mile watershed 
if it's mapped intermittent or unmapped to even, you know, consider those other perennial indicators. So, you know, and plus I don't believe, I mean, I took a quick look at the, um, uh, the wellhead mapping, and I don't believe any of those high production municipal wells are actually in the watershed directly within the watershed for this stream. Um, they may be in the larger watershed, but I don't believe they they directly, um, you know. And it's in it's you know it's the water withdrawals within the watershed for the stream you're looking at, not for you know, not for in, not in the general area that they consider to directly affect the stream flow. So, I mean, I, I, I'm not swayed by, you know, the arguments I heard. I mean, I, I would still, you know, personally find this stream to be intermittent. Thank you. Thank you. John. Thanks, John. Commission. Oh. Or someone saying something. John, it's it's our Chris D'Antonio. Go, Chris. Where could I you? have um? Could I have Deshane just uh, concur some of the points that Mr. Allen brought up? Deshane, could you please uh? Yep. Follow up, please. Sure. Uh, yeah. Good evening. Uh, I actually uh in agreement with uh Mr. Allen on the uh, impact of. The, with the drawdown of wells. I did actually do a mapping as a professional engineer, and uh, I don't see, I see uh, uh, the well uh, we are referring to, I can share my screen, is far away from the watershed contributing to this specific segment of the stream. So it may, may have an impact on a bigger watershed and uh, the perennial stream for the downstream, but just contributing to, to all our concern section that wells are located far away. I, I can share the town map with the overlay of the watershed map so, so the commission can see yourself. If I may uh, share my screen. Can you all see, see see the map? Yep. Okay. So that's what uh, Mr. Halsey referenced to probably the closest high year well, the town wells, happy oral wells group. And uh, here is our uh, site, 24 School Street, and the yellow with the green dotted line watershed, which is coming from the USGS map. So you can see they are not even, not only uh, far away, they are separated by, uh, you know, Dottery Pond, which will probably eliminate any possible withdrawdown impact toward this direction. So uh, so I just stop here. I think Mr. Horsley presenting some generically classroom illustration information and to interpret a very specific site and out of context, uh, it's really unprofessional in my view. Do you so, have uh, Do you have the private wells plotted up there? Oh, it's smaller private wells all over the place. I don't even believe uh, when you have a septic system, private well, and uh, the discharge to the sept uh, from septic, they almost canceled out. Okay, so there's no such an impact we can claim. Gotcha. Thank you. So, so if I can make it real basic, kind of fit where everybody's point is, at some point, this river was labeled as perennial. Such time is now labeled intermittent. There clearly, based on what Scott was saying, was there was some drawdown along the way, which it leads to this intermittent status. I think what um, Art and DeShang, you just said was, well, not that, well, not that's the case. All the wells are far enough away where they're drawn out. Where that would not affect the the localized uh, 
world levels, I guess, is what we're essentially saying right now. Is that fair? And uh, yeah. well, one more to make it. I, I don't even believe that 1970s line is necessary a perennial indication at day. I have a letter from a USGS from way time in the old days. They are not, there's no really scientific uh, support on those days as a line is basically because most of the USGS maps was based on aerial photo taken in the screen time. Then there's no means they were meant to be used to define a perennial stream under the Rivers Protection Act. That's a misuse of it. I have a letter from the early days from USGS directly. I can present it uh, to the board at the at point if you are interested in digging into the history. Gotcha, okay. Um, all right, Mr. Rose, I see your hand raised. We'll let you continue that while I have the commission chat a little bit, but go ahead. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to clarify, in fact, it's good that, that uh, DeShang has left this map up because um, his, uh, his argument here is a little bit flawed. The shaded area is a surface watershed to the stream. The U.S. Geological Survey was based upon groundwater withdrawals, which is a very different uh, phenomenon. Groundwater withdrawals from outside a surface watershed can easily, and I would add routinely, affect groundwater levels within a surface watershed that is a separate surface watershed. Uh, I teach a course at Tufts University and Harvard two civil engineering students because many of them don't understand the difference between a surface watershed and a groundwater drainage area. So this is a really good illustration point as to where some people maybe miss the point. And I would add, it may be uh, DeShang's uh, analysis and opinion that those wells he's showing don't affect that stream. But uh, I would go with the US Geological Survey, frankly, instead of DeShang. Uh, that's what their study shows, and it's the result of not just those three wells, but all the wells that I showed in my uh, my picture. And uh, if we took down DeShang's picture and put mine back up, you'd see that all of the wells that I showed earlier are within the watershed of the stream. Uh, and according to the USGS, affect the groundwater levels. I, for one, Mr. Chair, will defer to USGS modeling opinions as opposed to the applicant's uh, engineer here, and I'm going to stick with that. I would like to just gotcha. to comment Thanks. on that, if I can. Well, last thing, and then we're going to go to the to the commission. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, Mr. Halsey said, I have a PhD in uh, in hydrology and groundwater modeling. I have done a lot of them, and I, uh, to a some degree, most of the cases, surface watershed is in line with uh, groundwater watershed, but really. Uh, so if you do a statistic study, probably 90% with some changes is possible, have a different depend on whether it's a shallow watershed or deep groundwater. Most of the wells, I, I haven't do the investigation. It could be a very deep aquifer. And the, the stream over here is more uh, contributed by the unconsolidated upper watershed. So that's got to be different. And second, USGS modeling is like a very broad brush and they are not definitely not meant to be used for this local tiny bit little watershed study. So that's that's just a misuse in my view. So they are trying to paint a big picture on average, all the uh, most big drawdowns can impact overall, but there's no way they can be that uh, high resolution to, uh, to, to, to get an accurate study on this. This is just a from technical perspective. But second, as Mr. Allen pointed out, we are living with the two realities. One is we have to find it by the law, whatever the law required us to define a stream. And the second is even the drawdown is have a technical impact. So if, the, if that impact, you cannot eliminate it, whatever. So that generating an inter intermediate stream is going to be forever. A nest town or whatever is going to eliminate all the water supply and pumpings. So if they, before they can do that anything, that's an intermediate stream because we documented in 2015, the stream dried up for more than a month, period. Thank you. Ron, could I just have one comment then I'll be done. I know you guys are pressed for time, I understand. I, I just wanted to uh, 
remind the commission that we have three engineers, Peter Fletcher, the original, the original peer review consultant that reviewed this along with Arthur Allen, the second peer review consultant and Duchesne. We have three engineers that concur and then are on the same page that the stream is intermittent. I just wanted to remind the commission of that. <clears throat> yep, thanks Russ. Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, could I okay. just briefly be heard further? Uh, uh, Michael, yeah, it's the last one. Michael, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, uh, it was it was suggested that only the latest USGS determination of a stream is relevant. But if that's true, then Section F means nothing at all. But Section F talks about the effect of man-made drawdowns on a stream. And certainly you, you, you can't get to the bottom of this by just looking at the latest map. Um, the other thing is, is as Mr. Horsley has, has emphasized, based on a hydrological statement, and it's not just a question of weighing how many experts you have on one side or the other, that there is a large long-term effect that goes beyond just next door. And I'd like the, uh, the uh, commission to take that into account. I'd finally add that the applicant has the burden of proof here, not the abutters. The, 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 and, and I would submit that the burden of proof has not been met. There's been no explanation of why the stream suddenly became dry, uh, other than the evidence that we've already advanced showing that man-made effects very well could have done that, uh, had that effect. Okay, thank if you. I may just, if I may no, just no, 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 I gotta, I gotta cut you out there, my man. I wanna hear from the, the commission on a few thoughts first. Um, let, let me, we'll start with you. Any initial thoughts before I open up to commission? Um, no, I, I think we've, we've heard all this before. I, I think uh, at this point, I think the commission should decide whether or not they want to make a decision or if they want to review the material, um, do a little bit more in-depth review of the material before they um, make a decision and take a look at the presentations, the letters, the information that was submitted by both the applicant and uh, the abutters. And uh, I think it's up to the commission at this point, so. Okay. Commission, thoughts, comments, questions, concerns? Don't speak at once. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll jump in, uh, Sean, if I may. Please. Um, yeah, so first I just want to thank everyone. This has been a really high level discussion from a lot of really highly qualified consultants. And um, I've found it very interesting and very informative. I, I've understood the applicant's position for some time now. I've understood uh, the neighbor's position as presented by Mr. Horsley and Mr. Wiggins for some time now. In my view, you know, the reason we wanted to get a peer reviewer was to have an, an excuse me, impartial third party review um, to, to be sort of a referee here. Um, so I think Mr. Allen's been very clear in his opinions, uh, having had an opportunity to hear from him again after we did hear from Mr. Horsley. Um, I, I feel comfortable going with what we've heard from our peer review consultant that in his opinion, this is an intermittent stream. That's just my two cents, just speaking for myself, but that's sort of where I'm at. I don't really feel like I need to spend more time reviewing the materials, uh, but certainly if others do, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Well, I'll Thanks, speak, I'll speak from down. the other position. Um, I, do, I don't think it's intermittent stream. I think it's been drawn down by regional groundwater use and private groundwater use and irrigation, and um, it's affected it. So I think it falls into that clause that Dr. Horace Lee mentioned. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Tom. Barbara, thoughts? I tend to think that it has all the building and constituent and everything has affected this stream and it's been changed due to drawdown. I, I really think so. 
Okay. Robert, thank you. Uh, Jen, any thoughts? I agree with everything the other three commissioners have, have said. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so, so I, I agree. And so here's where I go back and kind of how Luke started it. Um, again, thank you for, for everything for the last little bit. Um, I feel like I'm, I've got a new education on earth science. Um, so I, I too feel like I, I've got a pretty good grasp um, on the issues over the last little bit. Going back to what Luke said, while, while I, and I'm, I'm no scientist, clearly, um, don't know, can account for the drawdown. Um, that's partially, I think, why we brought in a, a third party peer review is it kind of, is kind of, Luke said, you know, act as a referee or certainly just say, hey, knowing everything that, that, Dr. Hort, Scott Horsley and Michael Wiggins and, and what they're saying, taking that into account. Um, and, and he said it here alive again that, that he doesn't feel like he, that that really comes into play here. <clears throat> I, I'm inclined to go with, with with our peer reviewer, even though I do understand and, you know, Scott Horsley and Michael Wiggins point. Um, but again, that's, that's kind of what we, what we have a peer review peer reviewer for, um, and so that's that's kind of where I'm going to put my weight and uh, my opinion of okay, if I had to vote now, I'd, I'd vote with our peer reviewer if for no other reason. That's kind of what we brought them in to kind of help help break this time and kind of help me see see through what I don't know. So whether that helps clarify anybody else or makes it mar the waters murkier, I'm a little bit inclined to I guess I'll call it kind of think of how Luke was a little bit thinking of it. If that makes sense. And I'm leaning that way too. I am leaning that way too, Sean. Sorry, I didn't mean to, to speak over you there, Jen. So Sean, just um, sort of more procedurally, I guess, um, I'm just trying to figure out kind of where we are and what, what we need to do here. Are we essentially needing to make a call on whether we believe this to be intermittent or perennial? Um, and then the applicant can sort of proceed with the NOI is that essentially where we are? Uh, I, I I I believe so, Luke uh, and Linda uh, can certainly weigh in here. I, I believe that's where we are. Correct, Linda. Yeah, no, that's correct. I mean, before I think the the, the applicant can proceed with any future plan. I mean, proposed plans. Um, they're going to need to know the constraints of the site. Okay. So yeah, Luke, I think I think you're. Yes, voting on intermittent to then cause the other dominant to fall. Okay. Yep. Commission. So first, first let me start with, does anybody feel like they need more time? They don't feel like they have a good grasp on it, they would need more time. I mean, I'll make sure everybody understands what I'm asking for a vote on, what we're, what we're looking to do here. There's certainly no shame if you need more time. Um, okay. Um, with that said, does everybody have a, a good feeling on, on how they like to vote, or does anybody want to have any further discussion, or bring up any, any other points that we haven't brought up already to think about? Speaking for myself again, I, I don't, Sean. I'm certainly happy to talk further if folks want to, but um, I heard, you know, I hear what Tom and Barbara are saying. I understand it well. Uh, I, you know, really respect Mr. Horsley and the work he does. It's a big part of the reason why I felt it, you know, felt so strongly that we needed a peer reviewer. Um, but I, yeah, I don't, I don't need more discussion personally. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, I, I too, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm good as well. Um, so, um, uh, looks like if we can get a motion, then. Uh, whether we think the um, the property at 24 School Street has an intermittent stream, we can go from there and, and see how that goes. You want to make that motion? I'll I'll give it a stab. Sure. Um, I move that we find the stream on the property at 24 School Street to be a intermittent stream under us uh, under the State Wellness Protection Act. 
second. Thank you, Luke. Do I, do I have a second on that? Thank you, Jen. Uh, roll call, please. Uh, Barbara Howell. No. Yay or nay? No, thank you. Uh, Luke Legier. Yes. Jen Perlman. Yes. Uh, Tom Davidson. Uh, Tom. No. Tom, sorry. No. Thank you. Uh, and Sean Fair is a yes. Look, looks like we've got a three-two uh, yes on the intermittent stream vote. Okay. Um, is that all we're looking to do tonight? That's a question, Linda. Right? That's, that's all we're looking to do tonight. Get that vote. Linda. No, I mean we don't have any other materials to discuss. So that that was yep. the new material. I just want to make sure. Okay. So for that for for twenty four school Street for tonight, we're good. Uh, I was. Do we need a continuation since technically we're operating under an NOI, right? So we'll need a continuation then yes. to the eight. Or is that too soon? Or, or I guess I'll leave it up to the applicant. Sean, I, I'd like to uh, continue not to the 8th, but the following meeting after that. And the reason being is um, I have to speak with my partner now to see which direction we go, because it, it, it's I did meet with Mr. Bernard uh, to discuss the seven unit project. And as you can see, there's uh, we're getting we're going to get opposition no matter what we do now. So from a from a cost standpoint and a viability standpoint, you know, we have to reinvestigate the 12 unit now. I was hoping that this discussion would help put things to bed and give them a comfort level on the Bernard Horsley Wiggins side, but I don't I don't see it. So, you know, I have to we have to look at this from a economic standpoint at this point. Um, so that that's where I'm at. Uh, okay, so the November, Linda, what date would that be then? The after the 8th? We have a meeting November 29th, and we have another meeting on December 20th. Well, you know what, then? Let's go to the 8th, and that's pushing it way out. Then Let's go to the 8th. The 8th, November 8th. Okay. Yeah, let's go to the 8th. Yeah. Okay, can I get a motion then um, for continuation then for 24 School Street for November 8th sometime after 6.30, please? So moved. Thank, Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Barbara. Roll call, please. Barbara Howell. Yes. Luke Legier. Yes. Jen Perlman. Yes. Tom Davidson. Yes. And Sean Percy. Yes. All right. We'll see you folks in a few weeks. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Thank Have you. Good Thank you. All right. 1E. 113, uh, 115 Boston Post Road, DEP file number 322-1000. This is a continued notice of intent filed pursuant to the Wetlands Protection Act submitted by Dean Hickey for the demolition of existing structures, driveways, parking lots, and impervious and gravel areas associated with an abandoned nursery and the construction of a 60-unit four-story affordable housing development and associated drives, parking areas, wastewater treatment facility, and stormwater management basin. The project is located within the 100-foot buffer zone of a bordering vegetated wetland, 200-foot buffer zone of a riverfront area, and bordering land subject to flooding at 113-115 Boston Post Road in the Wayland Map. Property is shown in Assessor's Map 30, Lot 70, and 71. Linda. Just really quick, Sean, I'm going to recuse myself here. Yep. Oh, the applicant has requested a continuance to November 8th. Okay. Can I get a motion then? Please continue till the 8th and after 6.30. So moved. Thank you, Barbara. For your second. Second. For second. Thank you, Tom. Uh, roll call, please. Barbara Howell. Yes. Luke is here recusing himself. Jen Perlman. Yes. Tom Davidson. Uh, yes. And Sean Fairley, yes. Thank you, folks. We're on 1F. This is 23 Clay Pit Hill Road, DEP file number 322-1002. It's a continued notice of intent filed pursuant to the Wayland Wetlands and Water Resource Protection Bylaw and the Wells Protection Act submitted by Mivan Temaratunga for the installation of a retaining wall and perimeter fence, as well as grading and landscaping of a rear yard. The project is located with a 100-foot buffer zone of a boring vegetated wetland at 23 Clay Pit Hill Road in Wayland, Mass. The property is shown in Assessor's Map 19, Parcel 35. Linda. 
Um, I don't know who we have on um, available here for the applicant. Is there somebody here? Uh, yes, my name is Nicole Hayes with Goddard Consulting. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, hey, Nicole. Hello. Um, yeah, so we were here in front of the commission a few weeks ago, and we were talking about um, plantings for the mitigation of prior tree cutting that happened along the slope. And we um, suggested planting 12 trees and 10 shrubs. Um, the commission seemed to be fine with that. And then we had um, some additional requests for um, an infiltration area and some drains along the retaining walls. Um, Sudbury Design Group has come up with a plan uh, that uh, shows some of these features that the commission requested at the last hearing. Um, I sent that plan was sent in. Um, I can share it if uh, my screen, if I can share my screen, let me see. There we go. Can you see that? Yep. All right. So here are the, the red maple trees um, that we propose to be planted. And now we also have some um, birch, native birch trees in through here. Um, this is the high bush blueberry and witch hazel shrubs, um, 10 of them that we pro um, propose for mitigation. And as I was talking before, um, the commission asked for um, some infiltration area um, because of the slope and the concern about um, erosion and the grade. Um, so we've put in this infiltration area right here. We're also um, some of the drains through the wall as was recommended at the last hearing as well. Um, the engineers from Sudbury Design Group are also here. If you have any questions about any engineering or the uh, stormwater or infiltration areas, and we're hoping to um, try to, to answer all your questions tonight. We would, we would like to close if possible. Um, we've been doing this for a while and just looking to hopefully um, answer all your questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free. Thank you. Linda, start with you. Um, do, you have a, I'm not here, do you have a copy of the 2017 plan when the, the house is built? Um, it shows three different um, stormwater systems. One is an infiltration trench that was built at the end of the driveway. There's also a proposed dry well that was um, for all the roof drain. And that is basically where it looks like you're putting the stairs um, and possibly the retaining wall. It's hard to tell. And then there was also another infiltration challenge along the back of the slope to capture the surface runoff. And it looks like all are all three of those getting destroyed in this in this process. Um, I can let the the engineers answer that. Um, I, I believe sure. Yeah. This is Matt Sullivan, Silver Design Group. Um, so in, in most of these conditions, we're actually looking at a fill condition. Um, so those structures that are in place would stay intact um, from the previous construction. But not if you're expanding the driveway, though. Uh, so I don't know exactly uh, what that plan from 2017 shows. Uh, I just know from site visits uh, of being there um, and where I see the ventilation ports, uh, they're out of the area of the driveway. Yeah, no, there's a there's supposed to be an infiltration trench at the end, so it should be a stone filled infiltration trench. The trench I have not seen. I just know that the the dry well has an observation port. Okay. 
And so how far is this this fence going? Is this all the way around the the the, the property? Uh, correct. Yes, but the fence sits on top of the upper retaining wall uh, okay. that would be in the buffer zone, um, and then it basically rides the side property line up to the front yard. Um, my client has a dog, and really, it's it's kind of more there for safety of the of the pet. Okay. Um, also, I need a signed and stamped plan because these it looks it appears to me that these retaining walls, one looks like it's five and a half feet and the other one looks like it's six, six feet, seven, seven to six feet tall. Or no, we would wait, be having three a structural, to, three to six. What's that? We would be having a structural engineer provide the structural drawings for the retaining walls uh, to be because we'd be needing to pull a construction permit for those as well. Okay, well, I'd like to see a copy because I don't have any idea what the design of this is. So that's why it's uh, interesting to know that what that is. And I don't have much information on the infiltration area. I just have what looks like a little stone vegetated swale. Um, so what is what okay. is what's getting picked up from? How, what are you capturing in this stone swale? So in the infiltration area, we'd be capturing two things. We'd be capturing uh, the runoff in the newly graded area off the end of the driveway uh, coming down that slope. Uh, we would have a vegetated swale to basically go into this infiltration area uh, to be cleaning the water before it uh, infiltrates the groundwater. Um, and then we also have some footing drains on the retaining walls that would uh, end up uh, daylighting into the infiltration area to basically slow any runoff before it would get in any further down into the wetlands. Okay. Well, I guess I, I would need some assurance that you guys are not compromising the the current storm proposed the dry wells and the and the trenches that were put in. I mean, obviously, it looks like both the trenches are going to be gone. So now um, we need compensation to make sure that when you when those are are um, removed that you have enough infiltration to handle um, to that and then also like I said it looks like you're building right on top of the dry well um, the roof dry well and and I don't know how that's going to be compromised and including the the roof drains and everything um, because now there's a you're, there's a large deck and, or I mean there's a um, there's a big patio getting placed and right on top of that so I think is I think it's time that you really I think you really need to look at the the, well, the previous construction in, plans. Sure, in regards to those subterranean drywall uh, areas with for the roof drainage, uh, as I mentioned, these are in fill conditions, um, so we would not be digging into them. Uh, they would stay intact as is, and we'd be basically changing the uh, uh, top layer uh, for for this landscape project. Well, yeah, but you're still doing footings, aren't you? You're still doing, I mean, uh, of, I don't know. Correct. Uh, yes, but they're outside the, the, the work areas of, of those dry wells. But you just said you don't know where the dry well is, so. The the trench, you mentioned the trench drain at the end of the driveway, the, no, the but stone there, trench. There is, there is a roof dry well that consists of, let me look, I think it's six storm tech chambers. Um, yeah, StormTech SC 740 uh, uh, chambers with a, um, a roof drain that connects to it. Right. So so those chambers, like I had mentioned, you know, uh, I, I do not have in front of me a copy of, of okay. the proposed plan that you have. Uh, but just being on site, as I mentioned, we had noticed where the uh, inspection ports were for those chambers. Um, and we tried to work outside of where we believe the as-built location is. Okay. Anyone else? Question? No, I don't have any comments. So Lynn, let me let me put this back on you real, real quick. How com how comfortable are you with what what you have now? That if we were to close this, 
and you're just doing a little bit of cleanup on the back end, or do, do you want to keep this open? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm still a little bit uncertain. I have no idea what the capacity of this infiltration area is. I have no idea how deep it is. I have zero details on any of this stuff. You know, I, I just have a flat, one-dimensional plan. Um, I don't have any information of where um, the, you know, they should have overlaid the other structures on top of this, and. Um, We're not ready to close. Could, it, could, could, sorry, Brother Barbara, say that again. We're not ready to close until we get all this information in. I, I need a signed and stamped plan too. Um, you know, we don't. We tend to not accept these sort of things without um, a signed and stamped plan. So, could, could, you ask, could we get get a list, or either say it now or get them the list? So we. Yeah, can, I can. I can. I can put these in an to, email to to Nicole. And do we think, it, Nicole, that everything you've heard today is is doable and can get back to Linda before our November eighth meeting? To kind of wrap this up, or is that too short of a time period to turn that around with what you heard? Well, I think I think you're muted there, Nicole. If you're if you're talking. Oh, can you hear me? Yep, I got you. Okay, I think that's a good question for the engineers because um, it sounds like they're we're going to need a signed and stamped plan, um, maybe some more details about the retaining walls. Um, details on the infiltration basin. Um, I, I believe that they should be able to get that information to you for the next hearing. Um, but if Matt is still. Sure, we will definitely do our best. You know, uh, Suburb Design Group is a landscape design company. So we'd be relying on some additional sub sub uh, engineers on, on some of those things. Uh, we've consulted them on these drawings, but to actually get a stamped copy uh, that would be coming from somebody else. Gotcha. Okay. And the reason, reason I ask is if we don't, if you don't think you can get by the eighth, we can put it on the 29th. I mean, but leave it up to you guys. I would love to keep it for the eighth, and we'll, we'll do our best. Perfect. All right, Christian, does that sound like, sound like a plan? Perfect. Uh, so I guess with that said, uh, can we get a continuation then for November 8th, sometime after 6.30, please? So moved. Second. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, quick roll call, please. Barbara Howell? Yes. Luke Legier? Yes. Jen Perlman? Yes. Tom Davidson? Yes. And Sean Ferris, yes. Thank you, folks. See you in a few right. weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, on to 1G, 13 Chirina Road, DEP file number 322-1012. It's an abbreviated notice of resource area delineation filed pursuant to Wayland's Wetlands and Water Resource Protection Bylaw and the Wetlands Protection Act, submitted by Carol Seto for the confirmation of resource area delineation at 13 Chirina Road on the Wayland map. The site is shown on Assessor's Map 38, Lot 157. It is located within the 100-foot buffer zone of a bordering vegetative wetlands and a 200-foot riverfront area. Linda. The um, applicant has requested a continuance. We're having an on-site meeting uh, at 9 o'clock on Tuesday. Next is coming Tuesday, if anybody would like to participate in that. And that's to look at the riverfront area and the mean annual high water um, determination. When is that? Tuesday at 9 on site. Uh, I may be traveling, but I'll try if I can. Okay, uh, so we're continuing this then to the eighth. Got it. Mm -hmm. Can I get a motion, please, to continue this one uh, to the eighth and then for six thirty? So move. Second. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Barbara. Roll call, please. Barbara Howell. Yes. Luke Lazier. Yes. Jen Perlman. Yes. Tom Davidson. Yes. And Sean Ferzi. Yes. Thank you, folks. On the two, that's a request for determination of applicability. We got a few of these, huh? 2A, 26 White Road, D1011, just a continued request for determination filed pursuant to Wayland's Wetlands and Water Resource Protection Bylaw and the Wetlands Protection Act, 
submitted by Corey Walford for the expansion of a deck and sunroom at 26 White Road in Wayland, Mass. The property is shown on Assessor's Map 25, Lot 067, and is located within the 100-foot buffer zone of a bordering vegetated wetland. Linda. So we did. Um, we had this on the previous agenda. What I didn't realize is that the the, um, the applicant's um, co contractor was on. He didn't. He didn't recognize himself. So I. I we, we really didn't discuss this. Um, I think Barbara, you sent gave me your notes. Did you have anything else you wanted to add on this? Um, no, I don't think so. Oh, okay. Okay. Because we have approximate location of BVW, we did have a previous um, application for this many years ago. Um, it's a pretty sharp drop off, um, so I think it's. I don't think there's a question where the wetlands are. I mean, I don't know if Corey wants to add anything. The, it looks like the app, um, the applicant is here. Yes. No. I just wanted to be on uh, to answer any questions, but the the we're just um, building out our 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 sunroom. Um, but it doesn't go any closer to the wetlands itself. It will. It won't go any closer to than than what it currently is. So it, yeah, it's a conversion of a of a sunroom to uh, or a deck to a sunroom, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's already a sunroom. Um, it's just it's just expanding it out a little bit, but it okay. expands on the house, not closer to the um to the wetlands. And it's over It's over lawn anyway, right? It's strictly over lawn. Strictly over lawn, yes. Okay. All right. And the vegetation okay. behind the fence, is that just wild? Is that just natural? Yes. Yeah, we okay. don't, don't touch okay. that. The map we get was from 2007. But... Oh, the wetlands? Yeah. Which really is kind of old. It's really old. I agree with that. But like I said, um, there's no contours on this map. But if you go there... The, you can't you can hardly see the the chain link fence you know it, it's almost it's almost at the the top of it is almost at the level of the lawn right and so it, it drops off really quickly in the back there and I, I don't think there's I don't think you have anything behind the wetland the the chain link fence right it's just kind of the wilds of white road yes yes that's all it is okay yeah, can I example of Phil <laughs> brought in to, to build the, the subdivision there. So I'm good on my end. We're uh, we're all good. Barbara, whenever you're ready. I move a negative under Wetland Protection Act and a permit under chapter one ninety four. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Roll call please. Barbara Howell. Yes. Luke Legier. Yes. Jen Perlman? Yes. Tom Davidson? Yes. And Sean Ferrier? Thank you, folks. Appreciate it. Thank you. You got it. Uh, we are at 21 Pemberton Road. This is a request for, uh, sorry, D 1014. It's a request for determination filed pursuant to Wayland's Wetlands and Water Resource Protection Bylaw. And the Wetlands Protection Act, submitted by Steve Lemo, for the construction of a barn at 21 Beverton Road, Wayland, Mass. The property is shown in the Sussex Map 55, Lot 08, and is located within the 100-foot buffer zone of boarding vegetated wetlands. Linda. I believe we might have the Steve on, on a call yeah, here. I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. All right, I'll go. Um, Hi, Steve from uh, 21 Pemberton Road. I'd like to build a 26 by 36 uh, barn in my backyard. Um, my backyard was previously a building lot on Stanton Street, and it was merged into my property. I actually have 100 feet of, front of uh, road footage on Stanton. And uh, 30 years ago, there was a house there. So now I'm proposing to just uh, build a barn no heated living, plumbing. It's really not a garage. There won't be any, you know, cars in and out nightly. It's on a totally separate road. We're going to use it to put my Jeeps in, woodworking, things like that. Um, I position the barn. There's a, uh, uh, you know, an intermittent stream. I really believe this is intermittent. It's very tiny. And it crosses Stanton Street. So I'm positioning the barn 50 feet 
from the culvert on Stanton Street and 50 feet from the culvert on the corner of my property. I also have a um, 100 feet line of sight to a utility pole. So I'm truly building this on Stanton Street. I need to get power uh, from, from Stanton. Um, I built a water retention uh, plan underneath the eaves. On each side, there will be 40 feet of perforated culvert um, capable of holding a uh, 100 cubic feet of rainwater coming off the roof. Um, and that's plenty to hold like an inch of rain um, on the roof of this structure. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's about all I got. I don't have any electronic, uh, my plans aren't electronic, so I can't bring up the site plan. No worries. Thank you. Linda. Oh, what was this? I did you submitted this? Did you submit this to Board of Health for their approval? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I've got yeah, I got all the documentation from them. They're good. Okay. That's all I was confirming. And um this isn't in the floodplain, is it? I mean that I know that I've seen Stanton Street when that that uh, stream overflows and it um it's pretty messy down there. So I just yeah, want to make sure that my, my property is about three feet above that stream. Okay. In twenty in twenty years. It has overflowed, but it's usually if that culvert is plugged and it's a really torrential rain, it can flood the property across the street from me. Mm -hmm. I have but, seen that. Yeah. And you say yeah, you're the, not built you're not building an access to this to this um barn or are you? No, there really isn't going to be a driveway. I'd like to have grass, but we might have uh, you know, some kind of stone. I'm I'm 30 feet. You know, back from the the setback from the road, um, but there really won't be any parking in front of it or anything like that. I'm hoping to just have grass. Okay, you can also try that grid system, which is just holds a car, but it allows you to have grass on it too. So you're not really ruining your aesthetics of your of your lawn that way. Yeah, I have seen that. Yeah, and that that way it's it's uh, it's completely you know imper uh, impervious. So. Anybody else my question have anything? Barbara, go ahead. I just have a question. Where are the wetlands shown in the plan? We're supposed to be determining um, whether the, about the wetlands, and I can't see any information about wetlands. You know, I'm just, I'm just positioning out the culverts of that, um, that drainage stream. So there's there's a short small stream that runs on the on the other side of Stanton Street and then it goes under a culvert and comes back out again and then it discharges to his side of the um you know, of, Stanton. of Stanton Street. Yeah, yeah. and flows on behind somebody's house. So yes, there are wetlands associated with the stream. Um so I'm I'm guessing that let me think, let me look at this again. Well, it doesn't show in any plan. It's nothing about wetlands. It would it would be no closer than what he has the culvert locations, Barbara. So after the culvert on either on either side would be wetlands. You know where the where the stream enters and then exits the culverts. Where's the stream? It, it, you see where it says culvert on one side and one side of strand, and then there's a culvert where it says 50 feet. So that's that's where it flows underneath strand, Stanton Street and then exits. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anybody else the commission anything else on this one? I'm good if you guys are good. Can I get a motion, please? Barbara, you want, to make, I, want to make a motion? Or Luke, go ahead. Go, go Luke. Sure, I don't mean to step on your toes, Barbara, but uh, keep things <laughs> moving along here. I I uh, move that we issue a negative determine under this negative determination under the State Wellness Protection Act and a permit under Chapter 194. 
Thank you, Luke. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Jen. Roll call, please. Barbara Howell. Uh, yes. Luke Legier. Yes. Jen Perlman. Yes. Tom yeah. Davidson. Yes. And Sean Fares a yes. All set. Thank you. And on to 2C. This is 11 Corman Lane, D-1015, request for determination filed pursuant to Wayland's Wetlands and the Water Resource Protection Bylaw and the Wetlands Protection Act, then by Randolph Kilman for the installation of a stormwater management of a paved driveway at 11 Corman's Lane in Wayland, Mass. The property is shown on a such as map 55, lot 25, and is located within the 100-foot buffer zone of a bordering vegetated wetland and 200-foot riverfront area. Linda. Do you have anybody on for um, 11 Corman's Lane? And, oh. and I think um, also Mr. Magazine is on. Okay. So um, I know I think it was a few weeks, a few meetings ago, we um, issued a, a certificate compliance for 11 Corman's Lane for the septic system. Um, during the the transfer of the the property to a new owner, it was you know we learned that the Corman's Lane had been paved, um, and it's it's fairly close to Snake Brook, and it's all state property over there. It's part of the um, DCR property, so we took a look at it, and and it probably made more sense I think just to leave the asphalt driveway rather than than um, dig it up because that would cause a lot more disturbance. But what I did request was that we need to have some sort of um, stormwater management um, to, to capture all the runoff that comes off of this area. So that's what you have in your package now is, and this was um, how many site visits we have. Um, Randy, probably like two or three at this point where we um, sort of looked at the, the slope, the looked at the um, bump out on the, by, by the neighbor's house. And we came up with a plan to remove some of the pavement in the bump out, um, add some Rip wrap and then put in a, a vegetate or a swale, a, um, a stone filled swale along the low point of the driveway. It does kind of slope down from, um, what is that, Route 27? Kind of slopes down on both sides a little bit. So, anything you have to add, Randy? You were out there at least twice, Linda, to help us oh, figure out at uh, least. how to read it. <laughs> yeah, at least twice. So, thank you for your time on that. We appreciate it very much. So Linda, you feel pretty confident? Yeah, yeah. I think, where did I have, I, should, I did have a couple of notes. Um, your plan talks about just a, um, uh, the infil infiltration trench. And Randy, do you remember what we talked about? Was it going to be two by two feet um, in, in dimension? Or was it, or do you remember what it was going to be? Because I wanted two to- Two by, I, I believe it was two by two. Okay. It, it, The size of gravel, but I think Peter may have specified that in the document. No, he, he just says proposed drainage area with three to five inch stone. He just didn't say um, how big that trench was going to be. So I, I'm, I would like that detail in the permit. So if I write two by two, um, let me know if that's if that's the correct um, dimensions. I mean, if you and have a chance. Size, to, that's my recollection of, of the size of the trench. Yeah, I don't remember the exact size of the gravel that we talked about, but if you're okay with just three to five, then we'll, we'll go that. No, but I, I want to know the dimensions of the trench. Is it was it one by one? Was it two by two? It, it was it was two by two. Okay, two by two. all right, all right. Thank you. That's what all I needed. It was a little bit more details on that. I feel pretty comfortable, that Linda, with that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Commission, thoughts, comments, questions, concerns? Okay, hearing none. Barbara, you wanna make the motion? Move a negative determination under the Wetland Protection Act and permit under, with conditions under the um, chapter 194. Second. Thank you, Barbara, thank you, Luke. Roll call, please, Barbara Howell. Yes. 
Luke Legere? Yes. Jen Perlman? Yes. Tom Davidson? Yes. Sean Fraser, yes. All set. Thank you. All right, moving right along. 2D. This is DPW Wells, uh, D-1016. Request for determination filed pursuant to Wayland's Wetlands and Water Resource Protection Bylaw and the Wetlands Protection Act, submitted by Tom Holder of the Wayland DPW for cleaning and redevelopment of, sev of several wells in Wayland. The product is shown on Assessor's Map 18, Lot 18, Map 3, Lot 040A, Map 10, Lot 061, Map 37, Lot 33, all are located within the 100-foot buffer zone of a bordering vegetated wetlands. Linda. Oh, we have Molly. Wait, am I? Oh, yeah, yeah Mom's on. She's part of uh, Tata and Howard and, and prepared the application for um, DPW. I think we've seen this before. At least I know I've seen it before. And, and since I've been here, um, it's it's a standard procedure that they do to clean out the wells. Um, I don't, um, gosh. I mean, you're, you're happy to present, but I'm not sure it's really necessary. <laughs> I know it's, I mean, it's, you're, you're, it's you're, getting you're, late. I know you guys have a lot on the agenda. So, uh, yeah. No, go ahead. I'm, I'm here. I'll give you a quick overview. Like Linda said, it's just, you know, a regular um, necessary uh, routine maintenance activity for cleaning out groundwater wells. Um We'll have someone come in. They're going to do all eight active groundwater wells in town. So it'll be Chamberlain Well, Campbell Well. There's three wells at Happy Hollow and three wells at Baldwin Pond. Um, they come in, they put in muriatic acid and surge out the well to clean off the well screens. Um, over time, the well screens just get kind of clogged up with fine silts and um, like biofilms, iron and manganese. So they're just not pumping at the capacity that they're designed for or permitted for. Um, so it just gets those capacities back up and running. Um, all water pumped out will go through a sedimentation basin and it'll be um, neutr pH neutralized and disinfected before, I'm sorry, chlorinated before it's discharged. So pretty straightforward. I do have yeah, drawings if anyone wants to see them, but um, there's just site plans that'll show the location of those sedimentation basins. Well, that, I was going to ask you about that. Is, is is a contractor doing this? So a contractor is is hired to do this, and they to put the sedimentation basins together and all that stuff. Yep. So mm -hmm. the project will go out to um, public bid. Yeah. So we'll have the yeah. plans and specifications, and you know the lowest responsible bidder will be awarded the project. So who does the oversight? Is it the water department? Uh, it all depends. We'll work that out with Tom when the time comes. I mean, okay. we are involved with oversight on projects where they need us based on staffing. Um, so either they'll have someone on site for that or if they need us, we'll, we'll be happy to be on site for that. Okay, so is, I mean, they, they when they add, um, when they neutralize the waste, the water, is that is, is that done to a certain pH then? It has to be a neutral pH before they discharge that? Yep, they'll have like a tub that they put in the um, tablets to neutralize it to get to a certain pH. They'll test it and then it'll get um, discharged into the sedimentation basin and, you know, infiltrate through that way. Okay. Sorry, that's just my curiosity. But, um... Yeah, no, it's a. Uh... <laughs> and there's just one... Thought. Go ahead. No, just one, one correction that Happy Hollow is next to a perennial stream. Okay, that's as Dudley Brook. We saw that we were just talking about that at an oh. earlier. Um, yes. Um... <laughs> It's, it's definitely not intermittent, so. All right, thank you. Yeah. Anything else you want to add to that? Thoughts, comments, concerns? Molly had me, uh, routine and necessary maintenance. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> good opening. Yeah, uh, well, it's not very exciting, <laughs> so. But it's good, you want all right. water. All right, all, with that, Barbara, want to make a motion? I move a negative under Wetland Protection Act and permit under chapter 194. Second. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Luke. Roll call, please. Barbara Howell. Yes. Luke Legier. Yes. Jen Perlman. Yes. Tom Davidson. Yes. And Sean Fares, yes. All set. Thanks, Molly. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Two. Uh, 2E, 171 Gleason Lane, D-1017, request for determination filed pursuant to Wayland's Wetlands and Water Resource Protection Bylaw 
and the Wetlands Protection Act submitted by Sharon Boysen for the replacement of a septic system at 171 Leeson Lane in Wayland, Mass. Property is shown on a Sussex Map 11, Lot 56, and is located within the 100 foot, sorry, within the 200 foot riverfront area. Linda. Uh, I think Mike DeMonico is on. He's the, uh, oh, there you are, Mike. Um, yeah. He's one who uh, uh, submitted this application for a septic replacement. It's a uh, part of a um, ownership transfer. Sadly, it has, it suffers from one of my pet peeves, Mike. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's yeah. dumping yard waste into the wetland. Uh, so yeah. yeah. I, I noticed that. If you have that your excavator well. out there, you're gonna have to grab that stuff and take it out of there, okay? I noticed that as well, Linda. It is not a uh, fun thing to approach a commission when uh, someone has done that. But we <laughs> have uh, we have spoken, the homeowner and I have spoken about that, and that is something that has to be addressed um, during this process. Yeah, uh, it'll be a condition of the permit, so. Yeah, if you'd like, I could share my screen. I have a colored plan. Would that be okay? Please. Everybody see that? Not, not yet. Nope. But I have it. Oh, oh, no. There we go. Oh, there there we go. Yep. Okay. okay. Uh, sorry about that. So this is a, a uh, uh, replacement of an existing failed septic. It's shown here. The failed is a cesspool located in the rear of the property. as shown here in orange. It's approximately 30 feet now from the resource area shown here in blue. It was flagged in August of this year. Um, what we performed soil evaluation with the health department. A test hole is approximately here. Perk test here. We had a, a four feet of roughly four feet of fill. A perk rate of uh, two minutes an inch in the uh, soils. They're well drained. This existing cesspool is uh, fed from the house through the back of the property here to that location. The soil pipe is approximately six and a half feet in the ground. So the top of this cesspool is approximately seven to eight feet. Um, and then I think it's about six or so feet deep. What we propose to do is access the site up the existing paved driveway around the rear of the garage to this location and install a new soil absorption system, which would consist of some rectangular dry wells and a new 1500 gallon septic tank as shown here on the side of the property. We relocated the tank to be further away from the resource area as well as provide a significant upgrade in the size of the leaching field as shown here. Um, this uh, blue line is our 50 feet from the resource area, which we are maintaining. And uh, this green line is our 100 feet. We did look at trying to go to the front yard this area is a significant amount of ledge out front. It was tested in the early 80s when the house was built and developed, and it was not a reasonable area to, uh, it, it, it just wouldn't work. Um, we propose to uh, install erosion control as shown here in yellow along the property line in the back, up the side, and down this side as shown to uh, protect the resource area and the abutters. The plan has been submitted to conservation, I mean, uh, to health department for approval. They're, they have not gotten to review it yet, but um, considering the proximity of the house to the resource area, to the lot lines, there's real no, no other alternatives. We will have a public hearing for the septic tank location as it is, um, we need very local upgrade approvals for offset to the property line. Instead of being 10 feet, we propose eight here. And then uh, the distance from the house to the septic tank is gonna be reduced as well to, to uh, six feet. Um, and I think that kind of covers everything. Anybody has any questions? Where's your stockpile location? Is that just gonna be back there where the existing cesspool is? 
So the, there really is no area to stockpile anything. So the materials will be will be taken off site. There'll be some okay. stockpiling here in the back where the uh, where the dry wells are proposed when the septic tank gets installed. But most of it's just going to be trucked off site. Okay. Would you like me to stop sharing, or are you all set? I think we're good. Thank you. Commission, any uh, thoughts, comments, concerns? Okay, nothing on my end. Linda, you good on your end? Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Barbara, when uh, whenever you're ready, make some motions. I move a negative determination on the Wetland Protection Act and a permit under Chapter 194. They state that this is not designed for garbage disposal, which is good. And on the final, as built, we need the datum. That we should require the datum on the as built. Okay, heck of a motion. Second. Thank you, thank you, Luke. Uh, roll call, please. Barbara Howell. Yes. Luke Legier. Yes. Jen Perlman? Yes. Sean Fair? Oh, sorry, Tom Davidson? Yes. And Sean Fair's a yes. All right, I'll set. Thank you. Thanks very much. Have a great night. You too. 2F. Uh, we are at 32 Pequot Road, D 1018. It's a request for termination filed pursuant to Wayland's Wetlands and Water Resource Protection Bylaw and the Wells Protection Act submitted by Martin and Nicole uh, Ciselli, Cicel for the addition to a single family home at 32 Pequot Road in Wayland, Mass. The property is shown on the assessor's map 43D, lot 023, and is located within the 100-foot buffer zone of a boarding vegetated wetland and a 200-foot riverfront area. Linda. Look at Barbara's notes. Look at my notes. Sorry, um, I don't understand hers. But um, I, you know, the the problem with the plan is that it doesn't show wetlands, or it just shows a stream location. I don't have any distances or anything. I did pull up a plan from nineteen or whatever this was, two thousand sixteen, that did show um, the, the 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 delineation. And it does show that um, all the work is outside the inner riparian. And it looks like the porch in the back addition is in the outer riparian area. Um, but the front the front addition is outside the riparian area, just so, just so you guys know. Okay. I'll say Jennifer Perlman is the, the neighbor, is that right? Yeah, I'm gonna butter twice tonight. Yes, these are my yeah. neighbors. <laughs> well, you should probably recuse yourself from this if I'm voting on this then. I will. Yeah, she and I, will. She and I are talking about it. Um, anything else on this one, Linda? Uh, no. I mean, it looks like it's it's uh very little. Um, I mean, oh yeah. The other question I had was the patio. It says it says on there. A patio on the existing lawn will be added at a later date. So my question to the owner is: Are you are you asking for a permit for that, or is that something you're going to come come back for? To us, I, I think we would come back for that. So I think oh, okay. Uh, for that Without any details, we would be kind of um, in a in the dark here as to what we'd be permitting. So. Yeah. So we we have no plans to put a patio now, but you said to include anything that we want to do in the next three years. So within the next three years, it's possible we'd come back and ask for a patio uh, okay. behind the house on an existing lawn. So so I just put it there just because it's a possibility for the next three years, but we're focused on the house right now. Uh, okay. Um. What was I going to say? Oh. Um. I saw the Board of Health had a had conceptual approval. I don't even know what that means. Um, they've they've reviewed the the plans. Uh, you know, Comed. We submitted revised plans to them, um, and they had reviewed. Uh, so I didn't I didn't have their official approval, but they did. Uh, we did get through the ZBA board last week. So 
with the board. Oh, so it's no longer conceptual under the ZBA. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the ZBA uh, approved it last week. So. Oh, okay, okay. So then, then um, board of health would be approving that um, pretty quickly after that, right? Okay. Yeah. All right, Commissioner. Anything else? Marty, on record, how is it being Jen Froman's neighbor? Uh, it's delightful. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> That's um, mean, Sean. I didn't hear the word he used. What did he say? I didn't hear what he said. Oh, Delight. you don't want to hear. You don't want to hear. Jim. <laughs> Delightful is what he said. I got recruited into the softball league really quickly. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, all right. Anybody else? The commission? We good? All right. Uh, Barbara, you want to make a motion? Move a negative under Chapter 194, uh, under Wetland Protection Act, and permit under Chapter 194. Second. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Luke. Roll call, please. Barbara Howell? Yes. Luke Legier? Yes. Jen Perlman's recusing herself. Tom Davidson? Yes. And Sean Fares, a yes. All set. Thanks, Marty. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye. All right. On to stormwater and land disturbance. Uh, 3A, 18 Dudley Road, SWLD-116. Linda. Uh, where are we? Uh, oh, Dudley. We're, stormwater. We're, um, that was withdrawn. I don't know if you noticed it was a stormwater permit for a septic and um, Brian Nelson submitted that and we spoke earlier and I said, you know, it's, you know, we, um, septic sim systems are exempt under the stormwater bylaw. So he, the, we both decided the best thing to do is just withdraw that permit application. So, okay. Let's for, forget about that one. All right, moving right along. 3B, this is 30 Plain Road, SWLD-117, Linda. Oh, I don't see anybody for that. I, did, I think I'm gonna have to work with them separately then. Um, okay. You know, they, they brought it, they put in, I don't know what an NDS 40 dry well is. That's my only question. So, um, I don't know what the capacity of that is. I'm, I'm, although, you know, they're, um, it doesn't look like they're adding more than 500, oh, 544 square feet. So they, they, they do hit the threshold for needing storm water. But I think I think I'm just gonna have to work with them separately. I mean, they have the concept down, and they I, they know what they're doing. It's just um, I, I can't really evaluate this without understanding what the capacity of the dry well is. So okay. But I, I, again, I don't I don't I don't think this is a problem. So perfect. Moving right along, four on the other four A is signing a deed for 57 Shaw Drive, Linda. Um, uh, in a separate email. I, Sorry, just real quick. Do, do do we need to do anything then on Thirty Plain Road, Linda? Do no, you... you can just let me um okay. issue it when you're. <laughs> I know we, the the way the um the guidelines of the the draft regulations read is that the minor projects which are under two thousand square feet those it's kind of nebulous. Like, do they need to go in front of the commission? Do they not go, need to go in front of the commission? Um, you know, because we were considering those minor projects. But I guess until we really get the, the draft regulations adopted, I think, you know, I, I basically throw everything at you guys. So I just didn't know if you needed a vote from us. Well, you can. <laughs> would, would you, would you, I mean, if it makes it easy, why don't we get a quick vote? So we're saying okay, you're a, work, a vote for what? Do you, you work with the applicant? Mm -hmm. You finalize this. Okay. Let's go back and do that. Can I get a motion then, please? For 30 Plain Road. I move that we allow or ask Linda to work with the applicant and issue the permit. Second. Thank you, Linda. Sorry, thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Luke. We're a roll call, please. Barbara Howell. Yes. Luke Legier. Yes. Jen Perlman. Yes. Tom Davidson? Yes. And Sean Fares, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Luke, for snagging that. Appreciate it. Uh, now on a 4A, signed deed for 57 Shaw Drive. 
so I, I, what I started saying is that um, I sent you a separate email this afternoon with a quick claim deed that was approved by KP Law. There's a release of the mortgage, and then there was also a plan uh, for the showing the the con conservation restriction parcel. It's 7.27 acres at the top of Shaw Drive. Um, this was discussed years ago um, during the planning board meetings that um, they were going to need to um, preserve um, about half of this property, which is way more than they normally do. Usually it's, I think, 38%. And um, the, the contractor called me recently and wanted to know how quickly we could move on this. And um, it was just a matter of reviewing it with um, uh, KP Law. I had Monica and Brian go out and take a look at the property. It's, it's really nice. It is, actually has great um, continuity with some other parcels that we have. So um, uh, Hamlin Woods and on the top of, um, what is that called, where the, the water tower is, um, I'm spacing now. So we are help. Does, yes, we, um, so it does provide, you know, we, I think I think there's a possibility of putting some really, uh, a really nice trail through there. Um, so the people on Shaw Drive who used to use that entire vacant property for walking now at least has an alternative and they can then get to Hamlin Woods. And it's, uh, I don't know, Monica could jump in here too, but it's, uh, there's not a ton of understory here. So it would be a pretty easy um, parcel to put in a, a path through. Um, lots of tall um, trees. Do you want me to show the pictures we took? Yeah, you can show a few of those. That's fine. If you, if you um, can make it quick. <laughs> no, it'll be quick. Oh, well, we're going to make you go out there, Sean. Sean probably didn't eat dinner uh, yet. I'm pretty sure at conservation land, I'm always going to get a yes on. So you're getting a yay for me, whether pictures or not. Go ahead. All right, let's see, uh, hello, okay. <laughs> Here, yeah, these are pictures we took, so really beautiful old growth area. I hope I'm, I'm not going too fast, but this is, this is it. And it's pretty big, what was it, like seven acres or something? That was the panoramic 7 I took. 7.27, yeah. That's a panoramic I took. So it'd be pretty easy to build a trail through it. You just kind of have to go in between the trees, path of least resistance. Pretty property. Yep, there you go. I like it. Thank you. One of the few areas that is not, you know, um, it's actually a buildable lot. So it's usually we get wetlands, right? And water resources, <laughs> things like that. So now we have, a, we're actually, a, a nice upland lot that uh, we can do something with. We can allow people Love to walk it. through. So we have to come down and sign? I would prefer that, yes. I, I don't want to do this. I mean, I know I have signature authority, but for deeds and mm -hmm. CRs and things like that, I think it's much more important for each individual to sign that. So otherwise it looks Great. like it's just, I, I made the decision. <laughs> <laughs> so. so can we get down over the next couple of weeks, y'all? Yes, and please sign do. That for Linda? But why don't you guys take a vote that you want to approve and sign the deed? So, any discussion other than no? Good. Okay. Okay. A motion then to accept the deed for 57 Shaw Drive. So moved. Oh, sorry, to sign the deed. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Second. So Second. Thank you, oh, Thank second. you. Thank yes. you Tom. Uh, roll call, please. Barbara Howell. Yes. Luke Legier. Yes. Jen Perlman. Yes. Tom Davidson. Yes. And Sean Fares, yes. Thank you, folks. Uh, 4B, enforcement order for 124 Lakeshore Drive. Linda. Oh, I'm looking for my notes. I can't seem to find them. I, right, right, I can right. 124. <laughs> so, you know, there was, there was um, Lakeshore Drive's been closed for, I don't know, it's been probably over a year at this point um, because the um, the applicant at 124 Lakeshore Drive at some point had was was working on the slope and kind of undercut everything. And so there's been a lot of discussion with every so many different departments and regarding how we're going to handle that. And I was encouraged to we did submit. Um, we sent him uh, an enforcement order years ago for the work that he had done and asking for restoration and all that. And um, the, the it was suggested that oh here it is. Um, that we uh, issue a, a second enforcement order, basically just to um, um, confirm the, you know, to confirm the first one, 
which is we're going to ask him to close all his permits. He has five open permits on his property. Uh, make sure there's erosion controls up so that there is not um, migration of material coming down the slope from where the, the road is undercut and where it's also um, the road has uh, is, is caved in. Um, we'd like to ask him for a restoration plan in order to restore that slope and repair the roadway um, from, from where it was undercut. So this is this was um, sort of a discussion we've had um, recently about this, and um, I will be issuing that uh, this week at some point. And um, if you want to wait to ratify that until I prepare it and send it to you, that's fine. But I just wanted to put it on the agenda because this is something that uh, the commission needs to do, or that I need to do at least, is to put together this enforcement order. Um, it's it's a it's a public safety problem because there's no way that you can get any sort of um, uh, public safety up and down this road anymore. I was, yeah. was going to ask about that. I, I walk here all the time. How I can't believe the fire department's been cool with this road being closed for the last year. I mean, you can't get anything on Lakeshore Drive unless you go the, all the way around mm -hmm. the back. I mean. I can't believe the fire department hasn't said something about this in the meantime. Right now, hmm. it's it's part of a much larger discussion. So <laughs> I was trying to just give you a, a synopsis here of, of how we're we're planning and handling this and trying to get some action on that. So, okay. So, uh, is there a preference? Is there a preference for you, Linda, or preference for the commission on before or after? Yeah, it, it's up to you guys. If you want to, if you want to see the, um, want me to. I just didn't have time since I got back from vacation to actually prepare this, um, the enforcement order. And uh, if you want me to send it to you, I can do that um, once I've had it, have it all typed up. That's fine. That makes sense. I, I, yeah, that's fine. Okay. We'll, we'll 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 vote on it to send it on the ninth, on the eighth, or whatever next meeting. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I, I can still send it. It's just you guys ratify it. Oh, perfect. So, right. Okay. Perfect. We've been dealing with this for probably 10 years, at least. And, you know, oh, yeah. he, when, when we issued the enforcement order the last time, he filed an NOI to do this work, included adding a, bringing the slope up and making a flat driveway out of it, installing stormwater management in the, in the street to deal with all the runoff and everything. Right. And then he just, he just walked away from the hearings. I mean, it's been... It's been years at this point, and and you call him, and he's always there's always another excuse. And at this point, the NOI is I mean, expired. Um, so and I, I think I think we're starting to lose patience in town about you know moving forward on any of his projects and even closing out on some of them. So the, you know that's that's why it um, made sense for us to at least the commission to take action on what we have the authority on, which is basically his entire lot is within the hundred feet of Dudley Pond. So. Um, it, it's time that we get some um, resolution on this. Okay, send away. Um, public comment. I don't see. We have no participants. Well, I, I, I mean, no, we exhausted wanna, the audience. I think Barbara I just does. Want to mention that I don't know whether you saw in the newspaper that um, Whit Beals passed away and he contributed so much to Wayland's conservation when he was he worked for the town and then he went to SVT and he really is responsible for our having greenways because <clears throat> he it was the Watertown dairy and through Witt's work, um, and he became um, one of the directors of SVT and uh, among other similar positions he held over his lifetime. He, no, no one remembers him, knows him, I guess just- I, I know the name. People. But he- No, I know the name. And, and we should remember him. Hmm. He gave yeah, his it, farm in Southboro um, to, um, I think it's Mass Audubon, I, th I think. And I, thought, I, thought, I thought it was a trustee to the reservation he gave it to, but yeah, beautiful property in Southboro. Yeah, it was through wit. Yeah. 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 Yeah, big loss conservation wise. Yeah. Thanks for bringing it up. I appreciate it. <clears throat> 
Um, six or on the the minutes. Um, August third. Are they Barbara approved? Thirtieth. Yes, ma'am. The uh, August thirtieth. Barb, did you get, get a look at those minutes from August thirtieth? Barbara looked at them. I looked at them. And Tom, did you look at them? I looked at them, read through them, and and emailed Monica earlier today. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I guess then we have um, triple triple reviewed. Okay. Well, a, a uh, issue on that. If not, can get a motion then to approve the minutes from August 30th, please. So moved. Second. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Luke. Roll call, please. Barbara Howell. Yes. Luke Legier. Yes. Jen Perlman. Yes. Tom Davidson. Yes. Sean Ferris. Yes. Thank you, folks. Same thing for the September 20th minutes. Do we have the Barbara stamp of approval? Not yet. Gave. Uh oh. Uh, yeah. Sent them. Well, she gave her she gave her comments to us. I haven't had a chance to look at them. I'd like to have a chance to at least review those before we um we vote on those. Okay. Put those the next time then. It's a wee bit busy in our office. <laughs> mm. Yeah, no doubt. Oh, um, and by the way, we're we're getting St. Anne's. Uh, we'll be on our next. We'll be on our next agenda. Just saying. Okay. Um, anything else from the commission? But frankly, I thought 9:30 would be no shot. That would be out here at least by 10:30 or 11. So, thanks for help moving along here, folks. That was the agenda I saw. I said, man, we we have two two different versions going all the way to F. It's gonna be a long one. That, that's yeah, why they pay the big bucks, Sean. What's that? <laughs> That's why they pay the big bucks. Hey, my bonus Shepherd will be in the mail by year end. I can't wait. <laughs> well, the November uh, 8th agenda will probably be equally large, just saying. So. Okay. Um, well, if anything else, I guess let's uh, call for an adjournment and chat here in a few weeks. Can get a motion. I move we adjourn for the evening. Thank you, Luke. Second. 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 Thank you, Jen. Roll call, please. Barbara Howell. Yes. <clears throat> Who's here? Yes. Jen Perlman. Yes. Tom Davidson. Yes. And Sean Fairsy, yes, as well. Thanks, folks.